the, of at least one faction of the Seleucids and ruling on their own again with autonomy in their own land. And if you want to be in our good graces, <laughs> visit badbooksofthebible.com where you can subscribe to get our impeccable notes with our impeccable sources. Impeccable. You can follow us on Twitter. There's a link directly to our Ancient Faith show page so it makes it easy to share with friends. And best of all, you will not miss a new episode. We've got some exciting content coming your way in the next few weeks. I'm Jamie Bennett. And I'm Joel Miller. And you've been listening to Bad Books of the Bible. A production of Ancient Faith Radio. Come back next week when we find out just how convoluted politics can get. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. You're listening to AncientFaithRadio.com. He will be a staff for the righteous with which for them to stand and not to fall. And he will be the light of the nations and the hope of those whose hearts are troubled. All who dwell on the earth will fall down and worship him. And they will praise and bless and celebrate with song the Lord of Spirits. First Enoch chapter 48 verses 4 through 5. The modern world doesn't acknowledge, but is nevertheless haunted by spirits, angels, demons, and saints. In our time, many yearn to break free of the prison of a flat, secular materialism, to see and to know reality as it truly is. What is this spiritual reality like? How do we engage with it well? How do we permeate everyday life with spiritual presence? Orthodox Christian priests, Father Andrew Stephen Damick, and Father Stephen DeYoung host this live call-in show focused on enchantment in creation, the union of the seen and unseen as made by God and experienced by mankind throughout history. Welcome to the Lord of Spirits. Good evening, giant killers, dragon slayers. You are listening to the Lord of Spirits podcast. My co-host, Father Stephen DeYoung, the Reverend Doctor, is with me from Lafayette, Louisiana, very and, uh, reverend doctor. oh excuse me the very reverend doctor can i throw out my big title as well the and, I'm the... <laughs> <laughs> and i'm father edger steven damick in emmaus pennsylvania and if you're listening to us live you can call in at 855 af radio that's 855-237-2346 just like the voice of steve just said Matushka trudy is taking your calls tonight our engineer extraordinaire and we're going to get to those in the second part of our show. Lord of Spirits is brought to you by our listeners with help from Theoria School of Filmmaking. Theoria School of Filmmaking is the first Orthodox film school. The primary instructor is Jonathan Jackson, a faithful Orthodox Christian speaker, writer, and five-time Emmy Award winner. To learn more about Theoria, please visit theoriafilm.org. That's T-H-E-O-R-I-A film.org. That's you know, from our it's, sponsor. Uh... Because of the Theoria School of Filmmaking that, like Kurosawa, I make mad films. <laughs> okay, I, I don't make films, but if I did, they'd have a samurai. All right. <laughs> that was for our Canadian uh, listeners. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it, took me, it took my brain like a couple of seconds to realize that you were quoting a certain we're band of Canadian. fully clothed males. Fully clothed yes. males. Yeah, yeah. So this evening, we're going to wrap up our three-part series on the fall of man. Tonight is about the Tower of Babel, which we first learn about in Genesis chapter 11. But the people who first heard Genesis 11 weren't hearing this for the first time. In fact, they already knew the story, but most of us probably don't. So that's where we're beginning tonight, the context into which Genesis 11 was speaking. So what is that context, Father? Uh, the olden times. <laughs> Back in the day, the before yeah. times. Yeah. Back in the day when the group was cool and I wasn't in it. The way back, the before time. Yep. Um, yeah, so um, one of our major foci tonight is going to be the fact that sort of like the creation of the world and the flood, uh, the story that's told in Genesis 11, the first part of it at least, it's not that long, about the Tower of Babel, uh, is also 
a biblical retelling of an event that was sort of common knowledge in the ancient Near East. Yeah. And people are probably more aware of the first two, right? Like, it probably seems obvious to most people that, like, yeah, these different cultures would have different stories about the creation of the world, right? Or how it came into being. And uh, if you've, you know, done any reading at all about the ancient world or ancient mythology or the Bible and comparative literature, one of the first things you find out about is the fact that there are flood stories everywhere in the world, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but so this one, this one is a little more specific, right? And um, therefore, I, I think a lot of people haven't necessarily made the connection between this story and uh, actual uh events that everyone would have known about and and that are historical events right um so we kind of start with okay so what is what is even being talked about in this story which is sort of a longish paragraph yeah it's not chapter 11 of genesis it's not a big piece of text um and just and then the text just kind of moves on from there yeah i mean we consider that you know the flood proper right is genesis six through nine right and if you include as we would and as people have heard us do the last couple weeks include like cain and his genealogy in there with the flood then you're talking about genesis four through nine right uh this is not the whole chapter right this is uh, a good probably more than half in terms of text slightly more than half of chapter 11 of Genesis is actually Abraham's genealogy leading to chapter 12. Yeah. I mean, the Tower of Babel story is verses one through nine of Genesis 11. And then, then the rest is genealogy stuff. Yeah. Uh, Leading up, actually it's a genealogy of Terah, Abraham's father, technically, but Mm, yeah. um, Yeah. Yeah. Just so we don't get, um, actually in in a chat box somewhere. Um, They're going right now. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> but so what is, and, and, you know, there's kind of a thin, right? We, we treat this, we've become used to treating this uh, partially because, you know, most folks aren't big fans of reading genealogies. We treat this as like, oh, well, here's this story that's in between some genealogy stuff that we skim, right? Yeah. But all of the genealogies, and we've seen this several times, right? already just in the early chapters of Genesis, all of these genealogies will like hit pause occasionally and have small stories and pieces of information in them. Right. Mm -hmm. Like Enoch being taken up into heaven. Right. Right. Which is in Seth's right. Genealogy. Right. Or some of the stuff we talked about last time with Cain's genealogy. Right. Yeah. Things that they invented in the story of Lamech. Right. And this just feeds into, you know, I can't remember which episode it was now, but we talked about history and what history is in the pre-modern era. It's the story of a people and the narrative of a people. A lot of it is going to be genealogies, particularly of kings. And then, you know, certain exploits related to some of those kings or events that surround them and, and bring context to the story of that particular people. And that's, you know, that's what's going on here. Right, right. And so... This being only nine verses, right? Uh, you know, th- there's kind of a fuzzy line where we say like, oh, well, if it's if it's three or four verses, that's just part of the genealogy. But if it's nine verses, then this is separate from the genealogies. Mm, yeah. Right? Like that's kind of arbitrary distinction. Right. Because, so, again, there's not such a thing as verses back in yes, the day. Yes, or chapter breaks. <laughs> or chapters, or... yeah any of that yeah. right so right. so this is a a story that is now nine verses but that gives you an idea of the length that's in this genealogical material yeah. right um and so the easiest way i think to start getting into this in terms of identifying what this story is about is to start with babel right this is famously the tower of babel um and so uh the and I, I put this I put this in our inaccessible show notes. Uh, <laughs> I, I put the actual cuneiform 
of the Sumerian name uh, for for Babel, right? Um, which yes. is uh, sorry, everybody. <laughs> I'll put it if you're watching on YouTube. I will put it in the YouTube chat so you can actually see the you? cuneiform. Will it actually yeah, the, taste in you, there? YouTube will. Yes, I did this okay. last time and it worked. So <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> everybody can now see it if you're watching on YouTube. Hey, hey, YouTube people, all 21 of you. Uh, tubers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so, um, and. Hey, it worked on Facebook too. <laughs> Just FYI, oh, okay. Facebook listeners. Yeah. We'll yeah. let you. Uh, it's so exciting. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, I can't guarantee that people's computers will display it, but it's working. Oh, yeah, that's on the other. Mine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that would yeah. be the other issue. Yeah, It works on mine, um, so I don't know. Anyway, so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that in Sumerian, it's basically uh, pronounced gun or kun uh, digarak. Okay. Um, which, as we all know, <laughs> is... Uh, means literally gate of the gods right so it's it's made up of of four symbols uh for the folks who can't see which may be everybody but the people who can't see the cuneiform even though father Andrew just posted it um and people who won't be listening live who probably won't uh see it but it's made it's it's four cuneiform symbols the first one is basically a pictograph of a gate that's the gun or the kun Right. And then uh, the second symbol looks kind of like a star on purpose and is what's pronounced digar, which is uh, the word for a god or the symbol mm. for a god. And then so, the, so third... the symbol for a god looks like a star? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. All of this Shocking. is semi pictographic. I'm yeah. shocked. Shocked. Yeah. Shocked, I tell you. <laughs> And then the third symbol is what's pronounced rock, and that's essentially uh, to make the um, the word God uh, what we would call in Greek or Latin a genitive. So mm. that's the of the, essentially. <laughs> right. So that it's gate of the gods. And then the fourth symbol is a symbol that we've seen before. Yes, I recognize it from previous yes. notes from the last show. Yeah, uh, that, um, is sort of a diamond shape on the exterior that denotes it as a uh, place name. Yeah, and because it, it looks like a little walled city or something like that. <clears throat> so it's like the place that is the gate of the gods, right? Um, and the Akkadian name is Babili. Bob being gate, Ely being gods. You could probably detect the the L Ely right there. Mm -hmm. That Semitic root. root, Semitic root there. Um, so there's there's a bunch of debate because uh, Sumeriologists, like everybody else, have to write dissertations and publish journal articles. Um, as to which of these, the Sumerian form or the Akkadian form, came first. Mm, which is a translation of the other because they yeah. don't sound like each other. It's right. not a it's not a loan word either way. It's an actual what they call a calc c a l q u e where you translate the parts and create a new word out of that. Right, like you know everybody calls the town Red Stick and then change it to Baton Rouge to be <laughs> fancy. Right, <laughs> um, but um, in this case. The, the reason for that argument is that this is the only known case of a place name in Mesopotamia where uh, the Sumerian and Akkadian names for the place are translations, right? Hmm. Not like a transliteration, um, but actually they translated it from one language into the other so that it would mean the same thing, right? So that then raises the question, which came first? Everybody's like, great, now I have a journal article to write. Uh, and things can go on as planned. But both of them mean, right, one is the Sumerian form and one of them is the Akkadian and therefore Semitic form of gate of the gods. How we get from Bob Ely to Babylon is through Greek. Hmm. Because uh, the Greek uh, 
transliterated the Akkadian as Babylon um, quite directly. So if you, if you know the Greek alphabet and you're reading the Greek Old Testament or the New Testament in Greek and you come to Babylon, you will instantly recognize it because it's Babylon. <laughs> right? Yeah, right, uh, right. So, um, and so that just gets transliterated into English according to standard like conventions, right? Yeah. It's, it's yeah. beta, alpha, beta, epsilon, lambda, <laughs> right? Omicron, right. nu, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah. Babel equals Babylon. Right. That's a really important identification to make here. These are not two different places as far as the biblical text is concerned. Right. Right. And the, the place that should confirm that to you is right there in Genesis 11. Because even though we brush over this when we read the story, it actually says that they set out to build a city and a tower. Right. Not just a tower. Right. So it's the Tower of Babel, meaning it's the tower, actually ziggurat, uh, of the city of Babili, a.k.a. Babylon. Mm. Right. Um, now when you get to all that said, when you get to verse nine, right, Genesis 11, verse nine, sort of the end of the story, the, uh, Hebrew text indicates that the name Babel comes from the Hebrew verb Bilbel. Right, so it's presenting an etymology, like what it says in, in yes. the ESV. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. Right, so it's it's presenting, it's coming from the Hebrew Bilbel. Um, now, uh, it is a generally true phenomenon that ancient literature is full of bogus etymologies right? yeah it's true the the, the reliable you know philological discipline of etymology is pretty much a modern thing a ancient peoples did not seem to know how this worked and in fact the idea that that languages that were not mutually comprehensible at the time actually had a common you know er language was not a thing that occurred to most people either right right and so it was sort of whatever was close. Uh, sometimes even they're working in their own language. Ancient Greek literature, classical Greek literature is like super terrible about this. Yeah. Um, it's just sort of whatever word seems similar. Yeah. Uh, one of the famous ones in Plato's Republic is him him saying that uh, dikaios is derived from diki to cut. Wow. Which it's not. Yeah. <laughs> like at all <laughs> so. yeah it's interesting they have this idea that some words are derived from others but they so often get that wrong yeah 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 and they just try to to break them apart and i mean you could do that in english very easily too right people Butterfly. do it a lie yeah yeah being the classic example right um so that said right that said it's very easy and a lot of scholars will just say well like okay this is bogus right um I don't think that that's what this is, that this is an ancient bad etymology. Hmm. I, I would argue that this is deliberate. Okay. For one thing, uh, Akkadian and Hebrew are not that different. Right. Uh, and here's, here's how well the two pieces of Bob Ely, right. <laughs> the, the Akkadian name, that Babel comes from, how well that's held on. Bob Ely, I mean, it's probably pronounced slightly differently, but basically means gate of the gods in Arabic. Right. Like modern Arabic. Mm, yeah. I Okay. I don't have that much Arabic knowledge, but I, I don't know. Write in Arabic people. speakers. Some yeah. People okay. Good. Told you, me you this. checked. All right. Yes. Yes. Well-placed yeah. people who would know. Right. And again, it's, I'm sure it's pronounced a little differently, but basically like they could look at that and say yeah right um so it seems to me to be a difficult argument to say that whatever writer editor 
wherever you want to place this in the process of the Torah as we have it now coming together, right? Um, whoever that was at any stage didn't honestly know what Babel came from, number one. Bob L, right? But, uh, but actually thought it came from Bill Bell, which barely resembles it. Hmm. Right. So I would argue that this is a deliberate thing. This is a deliberate. They're making a comment. Yes. He's making a comment, right? This is not the place of the gate of the gods. This is the place of confusion. Yeah. It's a correction being right. And, And so it's more like how, um, the the ancient Hebrews uh, changed uh, Baal Zebul, right, which meant sort of High Lord Baal, to Baal Zebub, yeah, Lord of the Lord, Flies, right, right, <laughs> right. It's a joke. It's yes. trash talk. Yes, which is a reference yeah. to excrement. In case anyone didn't know, because that's where the flies all gather together, right, right. Um, so <laughs> it's more like that. Right, so this is a deliberate comment being made about Babylon. So, what we get, even from just this initial sort of cursory look at this little story here in Genesis 11, is that this is a text that is commenting on the founding of Babylon. Yeah, right, right. So, what what's actually up with the founding of Babylon. So we have a really good idea of when Babylon was founded. Yeah. Uh, which is kind of weird for events in the ancient world that. Yes. And this is very an ancient world. This is decent like, idea. This is not just like pre when Moses lived, regardless of how early you think Moses lived. This is pre when Abraham lived. Right. This is before the or three period. Okay. <laughs> so this is, way back right none of the old testament was written in the time we're talking about yeah this is over four thousand years ago yes um but what we know from archaeology and what we know from ancient writers matches up almost perfectly which never happens this like never happens (laughs) right so archaeologically the earliest reference we have to Babylon, right, comes from a tablet. So these clay fire tablets that cuneiform was written on are nigh indestructible, right? You, you get breaks and gaps sometimes. That's why I said nigh, <laughs> right? Um, but it takes a lot, right? Uh, the average one you could, if you threw it at your floor, it would make a dent in your floor. It would not like shatter. Right. Yeah. Um, that's why they've survived for all these thousands of years, <laughs> right? Because they're very uh, sturdy. And most of the ones where you see breaks, like if you're reading and you see breaks in the text, usually there's a tablet missing, or yeah. it's not that the t- whole tablet has gotten destroyed. It's that something's happened. There's a big chip out of the front that where we can't read the writing. Hmm. Right. Uh, some chip has got knocked off of it. Usually in like, you know, the city was conquered 14 times, you know, leveled, burned to the ground. And, you know, the tablet got chipped somewhere yeah, along the way. Right? Yeah, like, right. Like that level yeah. of thing. And we should say that most of these tablets that are out there are not cool things like the founding of Babylon or the bail cycle. It's, you know, like yeah. people's grocery lists and whatever. As far as we know, because most of them are untranslated. I know we've yeah. talked about that on the show before. Right, right, exactly. But, There's a career out there, people. You just got to get a grant. I would imagine the ratio of cool stuff to uh, uh, trade documents uh, is probably this roughly the same between the translated and untranslated portions. Yeah. So, uh, but... Uh, the the earliest one of these we have that mentions Babylon uh, is from somewhere in the mid 23rd century BC. Okay, so that would be the 2200s BC. 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. And somewhere in the middle of it. So, you know, the dead middle would be 2250, which okay. is near the end of the reign of uh, Sargon of Akkad. Which is such a great right. name. Yeah. Not the uh, YouTube dude. No, no. <laughs> the actual the original. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, the... He's called Sargon of Akkad. This will come up again later. We mentioned this before, right? Mesopotamia, historically, pretty much always until modern times, really, uh, was divided into northern and southern portions. The southern portion was Sumer. The northern per portion was Akkad, right? And we already mentioned the two languages, Sumerian and Akkadian. Akkadian is Semitic. Sumerian is a language isolate, meaning it's not related to anything. Yep. Uh, as far as we know. Um, and so within Mesopotamia, sort of the balance of power throughout the the 4th and 3rd millennia BC sort of went back and forth between Sumerian cities and Akkadian cities, Sumerian dynasties and Akkadian dynasties of kings. So he's called Sargon of Akkad because... He was the head of a major Akkadian dynasty. Right, right. right. In, in Akkad. But so near the end of his reign, we have a tablet that refers to Babylon as a town, not as a city, as a town. So it's sort of yeah. a settlement at this point on the Euphrates River. Right. Okay. So that's that's our earliest sort of reference to it being there in terms of trying to date its founding that we've got from our modern archaeology okay but we have various ancient sources we're going to go through these in order of increasing ancientness okay um <laughs> that um also give us dates mm. that we can work out and in a lot of cases uh these the, the person whose writings we have say that they're getting their information from somebody else who's even more ancient than them. <laughs> right. Okay. So they're citing their so, sources. But we don't have those sources to check on, right? right. <laughs> so we just, we have just have the sort of later, later. Yeah. but still ancient person. So yeah. the first one to talk about is uh, George Sinkelos. Okay, he's late eighth century. So late eighth century Byzantine historian, incredibly important. We've mentioned him on the show before, um, and uh, he says um, he has access to the writings of this dude Ctesias, who we don't know anything about. But he said he has access to these writings of Ctesias, and Ctesias says George Sinkelos had these ancient Babylonian documents about the founding of Babylon. So this is third hand, right? <laughs> Coming from, from George Sinkelos. Um, and he dates the founding of Babylon at 2286 BC. So that's sort of early 23rd century BC. Right. Right. Well, if it's there as a town around 2250, then 2286 kind of makes sense as a date for founding. But George Sakellos did not have that tablet that we're going by, <laughs> right? Right. Did not have access to that. He's going from other information. So a little more ancient than that, okay, there's a fella named Stephen of Byzantium. That's a good solid name. And we know almost nothing about him. <laughs> right. That's, right. That's why he's called Stephen of Byzantium. <laughs> but we know where he lived. Right. But he's sort of roughly contemporary with uh, the Emperor St. Justinian. Yeah. Right? He, so he lived like, in Constantinople. Sixth century. During the reign of St. Justinian. So in the, in the sixth century. And uh, he says that Babylon was founded 1,002 years, not 1,000 years. I know it's so great. One thousand and two years. You almost before, expect him to say, "and thirteen days." You yes. Know? <laughs> before the siege of Troy, which, based on his own dating of the siege of Troy, 
would put it at 2231 BC. Okay, so we've got three dates now, roughly the middle of the 23rd century, early 23rd century, uh, late-ish uh, 23rd century BC. Yeah. Yeah. And so then, uh, our most sort of ancient source on this is Pliny, or Pliny, but I'm going to say Pliny. Um, it's okay, it's English. I think that's the British way of doing it, is to do the I don't long know. I, like Constantine. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but, I've never uh, discussed Pliny with any British people that's, that I can recall. I may soon have an opportunity to do this. I will verify. Yeah, go um, check with them. Make a note yeah. of this. <laughs> um, Could you say so, these words? <laughs> <laughs> Chimpanzee. Right, okay. Um, <laughs> Aluminium. Um, so uh, uh, Pliny, who lived in the early 2nd century A.D., right? This is Pliny uh, the Younger, by the way, everybody, because there's an elder Pliny, too. Uh, and so he quotes uh, this fellow Barosus. So Barosus is an interesting guy. Unfortunately, we don't actually have Barosus' writings. We just have people <laughs> citing Barosus. So Barosus was a 3rd century B.C. priest of Bel Marduk. So he was a priest of like Baal and the Babylonian god Marduk in the 3rd century B.C. during the uh, Seleucid period in Syria. And so <clears throat> Barosus wrote in Greek. And so he sort of wrote down in Greek at that time sort of Babylonian uh, myths, uh, stuff about Babylonian worship and sacrifice, and sort of wrote that all down in Greek for a Greek audience. So he was sort of the point of access to ancient yeah. Near Eastern religion. For, yeah, kind of the, the Edith Hamilton of his day. Yeah, for the Greeks and the Romans, right? Yeah. Although he could, he had a lot more of the practical religious stuff about sacrifices right. and festivals sure. and stuff than Edith Hamilton does. Yeah. Um, so, but he wrote it. So that's the only access they had to it. It'd be great if we ever found Barosus because it would be just this treasure trove of information, but we only have places where he gets quoted hmm. uh, by classical authors. But so Pliny quotes him or cites him as having placed uh, the founding of Babylon. And in this case, he doesn't actually say the founding of Babylon. Hmm. He says that uh, they began to do astrology at Babylon at that site, right? And for him, right, we, we've talked before about how when you read, like, in the Torah, somebody calling upon the name of the Lord, that that's worship, right? Right. Uh for Barosus, that seems to have been doing astrology seems to be have been for him the beginning of religion. I see. Okay. Right. So that kind of equates it to the religious founding for him. S stars right. and gods again. Yeah. Yeah. Um I'm shocked. Shocked. <laughs> but he places that at twenty two forty three BC. Okay, so then to kind of wrap this up, you know. Our earliest date is 2286 BC. The latest is 2231. All these dates are basically within 55 years of each other, which you talk in the ancient world, that's like inches away in terms of dating things from the ancient yes. world. Yes. Yeah. And this is people writing centuries later and our best archaeology from the time. Yeah, that's crazy. Our best modern archaeology. So, so we we can be pretty sure that this is around when Babylon was founded or some major thing started happening there. Right. Right. Well, there weren't a lot of major things happening there yet. Yeah. Right? Yeah. This is what it founded. The yeah. astrology, you know, <laughs> a, a settlement or a town when, when the major stuff starts happening is going to come a little later uh, in starting in really the 19th century BC. Okay. So in the 19th century BC, this group of uh, uh, tribes comes in from the east. Okay. okay. And 
So this is another thing about Mesopotamian history. Um, Mesopotamia doesn't have good natural borders. Hmm. Subject to a lot of invasion. So they get invaded a lot. Yeah. <laughs> right. They get invaded by, and it's not just, oh, some other empire that's their neighbor builds up a bigger army and then comes and invades. It's like barbarians coming and sacking cities and stuff all the time. Right. Right. They come down out of the mountains and, <laughs> right. Um, cause there aren't good defensible nat natural borders. Um, and this is true also for Sumeria and Akkad at this point. Uh, so this group comes from out of Syria into Mesopotamia. So they come from the West and starting in the 19th century BC, they move in and they capture a bunch of cities, including Babylon. And so they get called by the Akkadians, the Amuru, which means Westerner, guy from the West. Okay. Right? And that Amuru is where the biblical Amorites mm. comes from. Yeah, I remember them. Yes. <laughs> so an Amorite is used, including in the Torah, but uh, even after the Torah into... Uh, Joshua and stuff. Uh, Amorite is used as a catch-all often for uh, giant clans. Yeah, right. And you know the the famous King Sion of the Amorites, right. whose defeat is commemorated in the Psalms. The yeah, yeah. <laughs> alongside Og, King of the Rephaim. But when they're referred to together, like in Joshua, uh, they're referred to as the Amorite kings. Hmm. So Og even gets lumped in there because, again, it's used as sort of a catch-all for giant clans. Yeah. Um, so the most famous one of these Amorites, particularly in Babylon, is Hammurabi. Or Hammurabi, if you're a hipster. Um, the Hammurabi's code guy. Yeah, that dude. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think he shows up in Civilization. I think you can play him. I think he's the <laughs> king of Babylon in Civ. In Civ. Yeah. Right. So... His, I don't want to digress on this too much, but uh, his law code is technically not a law code. But, oh, man. Big <laughs> disappointment. Um, but he does promulgate laws, right? Okay. And he promulgates those laws on publicly visible standing stones that we still have. So uh, that's why we know so much about Howard Robbie's uh, so-called code in air quotes. Hmm. Um but so Hammurabi establishes, not only builds up Babylon into a city, but he makes it into the capital city of an empire. And this is really the first empire, right? This is the original empire because you had, you know, as we mentioned, Akkad and Sumer going back and forth, right? But like these are neighbors in Mesopotamia. Yeah, just a local right? thing. And there are tribal movements and shifts at population shifts and stuff. But when we talk about an empire, when we talk about a transnational empire, right, that has like trade and infrastructure, right, and um, is able to move things from literally one side of the known world to the other, right? The first one of those is Hammurabi's Babylonian Empire. Hmm. Um. And uh, he ended up conquering, like, all the Mesopotamian cities you've heard of. So Ur, Uruk, Eridu, that we talked about last time, right? A whole bunch of other ones that are less commonly known he took. But his reach extended. He went up into uh, Asia Minor. He went up, And his reach with trade... Here's how extensive it was. You know, we call this the Bronze Age, right? right? Like, he was getting his bronze by going to Cyprus to get copper. Right. right? That's where Cyprus gets its name. In fact, the word Cyprus and copper are cognate. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's literally where it got its name. You go yeah. to Cyprus to get copper and then mine tin in what's now Afghanistan. Yeah, because you have to have both. And bring it back and smelt it. Right, into bronze. Uh, Hammurabi, also we know, really liked the style of sandals they made in Crete. 
so he would get them imported. Those like Cretan sandals. Cretan sandals, yes. Those were the hot sandals. <laughs> they, yes, he was the sneakerhead uh, of his day. <laughs> um, <laughs> but so that shows you, that shows you here in the, you know, first half of the second millennium BC, right, that this empire connected the world. Right. Mm. This is this is the first world empire and brought what was at the time these wonders of technology. Right. And this cosmopolitan trade. Right. And in the sort of imperial propaganda, this was because the uh, the Amuru, the Amorites, had brought back the golden age from before the flood. Yeah, this this idea of antediluvian knowledge. Right. They had, through their connection with the gods, right, maintained this secret wisdom from the Apkalu we've talked about, right? The Apkalu story is a Babylonian story, right? Um, of this knowledge that was revealed to the kings before the flood, and now the Amorites have it, right? And that is what has allowed them to establish, uh, to establish this, this great empire. Hmm. So this is, and, and this is so thorough that, you know, we, we talked to several times already now about Akkad and, and Sumer, right. As being these two Mesopotamian regions and Mesopotamian powers that go back and forth. You don't hear about either of them in the old Testament, right? Like, I mean, you hear about cities, right? Like Ur, right? But the word Sumer or Sumerian or the word Akkadian or Akkad don't show up. Yeah. Right? But that's because of how successful this empire is at transforming even how people view the world. So before this, you have Akkad and Sumer or Sumeria, right? After this the northern region of Mesopotamia is called Assyria, and the southern portion is called Babylonia. Hmm. And so that's why when we get into the former prophets, what are sometimes called the historical books of the Old Testament, you see these references to Assyria and Babylonia, yeah. right? Babylon. And you don't see references to Sumer and Akkad because Babylon, this first great world empire, sort of looms large. Right. Yeah. And of course, it doesn't still exist. Right. <laughs> so it collapses. Um, when people, base, who, based on the Old Testament, think about the Babylonian Empire, you're thinking about like Nebuchadnezzar and his father, Nabopolassar. Right. That's called the Neo Babylonian Empire. Yeah. They were self consciously trying to reconstruct after they defeated the Assyrians. They were trying to self-consciously reconstruct and appropriate Hammurabi's original Babylonian Empire. From like, what, a thousand years before? Yeah. 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 A little more than a thousand years before. Yeah. Um, but much like the Holy Roman Empire, you know. Right. Come on, man. None of those words were correct. You're not, you're not <laughs> fooling anybody. Um, <laughs> but so this original empire collapses it it um its collapse is really uh the beginning it sets the balls rolling that ultimately produce the the bronze age collapse the collapse of the bronze age as such right hmm. so it starts with barbarians from the edges right coming and starting to sack cities babylon itself got sacked in i believe 1499 for the first time um, th this is all going to repeat with the Roman Empire, right? Later on, <laughs> the Western Roman Empire, right? Um, so uh, it starts getting sacked. Things start to crumble, right? And then when you get, as you move into the second half of the second millennium BC, uh, everything just falls apart. Um, mm. <laughs> that's all, all of these trade relationships fall apart. It's not that people like forgot how to smelt bronze. It's just they yeah. couldn't get copper and tin. Yeah. Logistically. 
Yeah. Um, and so the, its collapse is the beginning of everything's collapse, right? And so the whole period, I mean, so the, the exodus is portrayed as happening during this period where Egypt actually survives the Bronze Age collapse, which is massively weakened. Hmm. Right. And when we get, this is part of the background, when we get into Judges and First Samuel and Second Samuel or First and Second Kingdoms in the Orthodox Study Bible, right? What that part of history is literally post apocalyptic. Hmm. Huh. Right, like, like they are in the ruins of this Bronze Age civilization. So basically, Judges is sort of the Mad Max of its yes. era. Yes. Yeah. Wow. And wow. Uh, yeah, and then First and Second Samuel is like the last thirty or so issues of Walking Dead, right, <laughs> where they're pulling civilization back together. Right, and that's. So we tend to have this very medieval Western read of King Saul and King David, partially yeah. due to Renaissance art <laughs> that portrays them that way. Uh, but in actuality, especially Saul was basically a tribal chieftain. Yeah. And David was maybe a step above that. Right. They were really pulling things together. I mean, you'll read these things like, at the time Saul becomes king, like the Philistines have basically made sure that there weren't any blacksmiths, Israelite blacksmiths. So they don't even have like weapons. Wow. They're fighting with like farm implements, right? <laughs> like they don't have a standing army. Um, so yeah, so there's, there's this apocalypse that happens, the Bronze Age collapse. And those earliest stories are crawling out of sort of that wreckage. The Philistines themselves, right, were were one of the sea peoples. Yeah. Who so, yeah. came from the Greek islands because of climate change and economic collapse and famine. They migrated south. They tried to invade Egypt and lost. And so they settled along the coast of the Levant. That's why you have those coastal Philistine cities. Right. Right. So they're like remnants of this collapse, right? <laughs> this like apocalypse, right? Mm. Um, yeah. And so that's why it's such a big deal in, in First Samuel when Goliath comes out, because not only is he a giant, right? But he's wearing all bronze. Yeah. He's this warrior of the ancient days. Yeah. He's got a magical item in every slot basically, right? Because right. they couldn't make any of those. They don't have enough bronze to make any. That's why it goes on and on about the weight of these things, right? Oh, yeah. Like, no one has that much bronze to make something like that, even if they wanted to at this point. Hmm. Um, so, so yeah. So, there's this, there is this collapse, right, that, that happens of that empire centered around the city of Babylon. Right. And then from the whole world having been sort of pulled together by that empire and connected by that empire, everything ends up fragmented and confused. Hmm. Right. Um, so as a, as a last note, and this is a pattern that'll be familiar to our longtime listeners, uh, at Babylon during this period, the main gods who are being worshipped are Shemesh, who's the sun god, the Semitic sun god. Uh, that Samson's parents name him after as the sort of most high God. And then Marduk at this point is seen as his son who sort of mm. presides in the council of the gods, sort of okay. like Ellen Baal or Cronus and Zeus. Yeah, right? exactly. Um, the same pattern is going on there. And just like in those other cases, Shemesh sort of drifts off and Marduk sort of becomes the main show. Like yeah. Baal we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this pattern a little bit more on our, on our next episode, but our forthcoming. Yes. Thunder gods. Thunder gods. Ho. Oh, oh, wait, wrong. <laughs> um, sort of opening this whole thing going on. Um, so, with that in mind, right, about, about Babylon, right, and what Babylon would have represented in the uh, 
sort of common imaginary of the people at the time that the Torah is first being promulgated, it's first being heard, right? Uh, now we can go back to Genesis 11. And sort of okay. set the telling of the story there over against this background. Yeah. Right. Um, so one of the things we see right off the bat is this idea that everyone speaks the same language. Yeah. Yeah. This is where you break. It's not quite Sunday school for me, but you're breaking something for me. But go ahead, break it. <laughs> it's fine. You know that so, this is very, very, very personal for me. Yes. The idea here is, is again, this is not meant as sort of a literal thing, uh, right? It's a knife to the heart, man, that they're not actually all speaking the same right. language. The idea is this is a way of portraying an interconnected world, right? Mm. They're all on the same page. This is speaking the same language like uh, when someone comes up to me as a Dutchman and offers me a coupon, I say, now you're speaking my language. <laughs> <laughs> it's in that sense right would you like a discount sir <laughs> so the idea is that all of humanity is united and what's it united by by this city of this tower mm. right by babylon yeah so the idea of, of a single language is symbolic right it's pulled them literal. together to this common purpose right um so then uh if we back up a little bit into chapter 10, right? Another one of these little interjections happens in uh, the genealogy of uh, Ham. And uh, that is about this uh, Nimrod fellow. Oh yeah, uh, Nimrod, the which, great hunter. Yes, well, and, and, and uh, for, for our millennial and Zoomer uh, listeners, uh, there was a time way back in the long ago, when calling someone a Nimrod was a great insult. It's true. It meant kind of an idiot, sort uh, of. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and I have no idea how exactly that happened. Right, because there's right. nothing in the but text that suggests you was some kind of stupid person. Yes, you know? but, but that was a thing at one point. There you are, yeah. Um, in the ancient world of the uh, 1970s. Um <laughs> AD. Uh, so, um, and what we read about Nimrod in Genesis 10, 8, and 9, right, is that he's the son of Cush and he's the first on earth to be a mighty man. Yeah. What's the Hebrew word there for mighty man? Gibur. Right. Which should which remind us all Genesis chapter 6. Yes. That's the same word. These were the mighty men of old, right? Yeah. The men of renown. Right, so he's a mighty, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. <laughs> right, um, so it's going to be the origin of a saying. So Nimrod uh, is not only connected to the giants by that Genesis six four reference, but uh, also by the fact of his name, which is linguistically identical to Ninurta. Okay, who a so who's Mesopotamian god? Yeah, yeah, uh, Mesopotamian. Yeah, so he's literally carrying the same name as this god. Right, right. So, what this text, this genealogy, is doing is saying is identifying this Mesopotamian god as actually being this giant figure. Mm. Right, Nimrod. So, if you've been reading Genesis for a few chapters by this point, you would say to yourself, "Wait, I've seen this before." Yes. Giants are arising again. Yes. So we have this pattern, right? What was the pattern? Genesis, you know, four through nine. We have the genealogy of Cain, and that leads us up to and rolls us, like we talked about last time, rolls us into the flood where everything gets destroyed, right? Death by holiness happens, right? To purify, to purify the earth, right? And so... If we're reading along here, we should, should see, oh, oh boy, right? It's all starting to happen again. The same cycle is repeating. We have this genealogy. We have giants showing up, right? Everything is uh, is repeating, right? Um, and so 
the biblical story then by that pattern fundamentally agrees with the Babylonian propaganda about it, right? Because the Babylonian propaganda was, yes, we are the new incarnation of before the flood, hmm. right? So the the text of Genesis is very much saying, yes, they were the new incarnation of what was before the flood. And that's bad, right? This is yeah. terrible, right? Um, and so um, then we have this element, sort of the central element here, the sort of this purpose. What are they trying to do? Yeah, right. right. This this isn't this is in the beginning of Genesis eleven, where it says um, in verse four. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Right. And so they're trying to build, right, this this tower up to heaven, right? And that is in part going to sort of cement this un union of humanity, right, in this empire. Um now, this may be a ruined Sunday school also, now that I think about it. So, sort of like when the snake lost his legs, people read this as like, oh, those dummies, they thought they could just build a really tall tower and it would reach God up in heaven. Right, right because of course they knew that gods existed at a certain altitude. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's where you have to... Right. You have to think that's what they think. But allow me to suggest, if that's what they were really trying to do, <laughs> God wouldn't have had to do anything. Yeah. Right. He wouldn't have needed to stop them. He could yeah. he could have just let them go. Been like, okay, guys, have fun, right? Um, so there's no reason to sort of punish that. It's its own punishment because it's stupid, right? <laughs> um, but this is something which God feels the need to put an end to, right? Um, so if we look at how this idea of someone wanting to ascend into heaven, right? Someone wanting to ascend to the heavens. And this is part of how we know we're talking about a ziggurat because the word ziggurat literally means like a high or raised place. Right? Okay. Um, when we look at how that, that plays out in the rest of scripture, right? So Deuteronomy 30 verse 12, talking about the commandments, of the Torah, right? And obeying them, right? It says, it is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it, right? So the idea here is that this reaching up to heaven is to go up there and bring something down, not to go up there and live up there. Right. Right. So this isn't, Babel isn't man seeking some alternate way of salvation, right? Like salvation's going to heaven and we're going to get there by building a tower, right? Yeah. That's not, That's not <laughs> what's how this going works. On. Right. It's to bring something down. And then St. Paul applies this idea even further in Romans 10, verse 6, where he says, but the righteousness based on faithfulness, I'll retranslate it, says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, right? So he's referencing Deuteronomy. Uh, it says that is to bring Christ down. Yeah, so it's again, it's this image of going up there to bring something down. Right. And so someone may say, well, how do you know that what St. Paul's talking about in Romans is what's going on here? Well, what St. Paul says in Romans makes no sense if he's not talking about what's going on here. Right? Why would who will go up for us into heaven mean bring Christ down from heaven? Right. Like there's no frame that within which that makes sense. Like no one ever. Right. Yeah. Not other than this. Right. 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 Exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. So the idea here, the problem, the problem is not that they think they could build something tall enough to reach heaven. The problem is that they're trying to bring God down. Yeah, and this is exactly how idolatry works in the ancient right. world. Set up right. an idol, this... bring a god into it, make it do what you want. Right, and then that, and they're doing that so that, 
right, to sort of empower and preserve their empire. Mm. They want to bring God down to elevate themselves, not literally elevate themselves, <laughs> right? But in order to to preserve, right, this empire. So in the story, Yahweh does come down, <laughs> right? But he, when, when God comes for a visit, right? It's not get out the, the tea and biscuits, right? It's things are going to get settled, right? So you might think, well, if God comes down into this scene, these people are all going to get wiped out, right? They're just going to get obliterated, right? Like Babylon's going to be like Sodom and Gomorrah. But we just had a story that preceded this about the flood, hmm. right? And that's what happened in the story about the flood. So the first time this pattern happened, yes, everyone got destroyed. But then afterwards, God made a promise, right? And he set down his bow in the clouds. And again, rainbow is not bow like a pretty bow on a present. It's bow like a bow and arrow. God sets it down in the clouds, right? And that's a sign because every time you see it, you can say, yeah, it's still sitting there. He hasn't picked it back up again. Hmm. That's the idea. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so he's not going to destroy humanity again. Yeah, he's laid down his arms. Right. But so if humanity has become wicked like they did before the flood, and if God has promised not to wipe them all out again, what's the other option besides death by holiness? Exile. Exile. Yeah. God yeah. has to separate himself from humanity. Right. Uh, so rather than them being able to sort of pull God down and make him do what they wanted, instead he pulls back and disperses them. Right? Yeah. And, and, and so this is Genesis depicting the Bronze Age collapse as being an act of God. And it's bound up in this story of the city and the tower of Babylon here at the beginning of Genesis chapter 11. Right. That that previous civilization was just as wicked. It was the reproduction of the one before the flood that was also wicked. And so God is the one who brought that down. And, and as we're going to talk about here in a little bit, uh, in the second half, established a new order, a new world order. As it were. <laughs> That's after uh, sort of the disassembly of, of the Bronze Age uh, civilization. But before we get to that here at the end of the first half of three, um, just a couple of notes, right? The first big note being about we've been going through Genesis 1 through 11, basically, these last three shows. Yep. Um, three episodes. And... Um, that's appropriate because we're talking about, right, the, the three falls of man that are recorded there. Um, there is sort of a shift in the way the narrative is told at, at this point in Genesis in the sense that starting with chapter 12 with Abraham, we're reading about the life of a guy, his son, his grandson, and his great-grandsons, right? And it's sort of the narrative is going through the lives of these people, whereas the first 11 chapters are a little more of a macro view in the sense that we don't like follow Enoch yeah. or Cain or Seth, like their life, or even Adam and Eve, their yeah. lives, like over the course of their lives, right? right. We find out right. about their deaths, like in a genealogy, <laughs> right? Um, we don't read a narrative account of their life and their death, right? So th there is a, th there are differences there, okay? Um, but it has become very common uh, in uh, scholarly circles and non-scholarly circles, even some uh, orthodox circles, to talk about this uh, massive genre difference, between Genesis 1 through 11 and Genesis 12 through 50. Um, that these are really two, 
like they're all lumped together into the book of Genesis, but these are really two doing two completely different things. Yeah, that that the beginning is quote unquote myth and then the rest is quote unquote history. As right. as though the history part you're supposed to take this pretty literally, but the stuff before that is all kind of big sweeping symbols and woo stories of the ancient world. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's the technical term for mythological studies, by the way. Is woo woo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well you have to you draw it out to like three or four syllables. Well, then you just sound like you're doing a ghost impression. <laughs> well, ghosts are related to all of this. Or you could do Herculoids, like... Blah, 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 blah. But, oh, hey. man. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah. And, and so then the, the first 11 chapters, right, we, we just sort of set aside in terms of anything to do with history and try to extract something from it, whether it's some kind of moral lessons, whether it's... Uh, some kind of, I mean, you lately in our contemporary world, it's basically like the only reason Adam and Eve are in the Bible is to tell us what manhood and womanhood are, right? That's it, <laughs> right? And Cain and Abel, you can't get much out of except, you know, murdering your brother is bad. Uh, skip all the genealogies, uh, flood bad, um, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, Tower of Babel don't talk much about it all. Uh, don't really know what to do with it. Um, yeah, and so there's there's um, a lot of problems with this. Um, one of the biggest ones is that uh, ancient people made no such distinction between myth and history. Yeah, it's just not a thing. Medieval people didn't even make a distinction between myth and history, right? Let alone no. ancient people. This doesn't no, even stop I mean, at late antiquity. Yeah, like, like for instance, you know, um, in our next episode, we're going to talk about, very briefly, I'm going to mention Saxo Grammaticus, the Danish historian from the um, 12th century. And he does a whole book of the, the you know, the origins of the kings of Norway, right? Of, of sorry, of, of, well, the Danish kings and so forth. And he starts with what we would consider to be prehistory and then shows how they're kind of descended from those that are worshipped as gods up there. Yeah. You know, on up to his own point in history. Yeah. Like, it's all yeah. just one big narrative for him. Yeah. And so nobody, I mean, you look at the genealogies of Christ in the New Testament, right? They don't indicate, like, okay, well, this Adam guy, you know, Seth, eh, eh, you know, then you get to Abraham, you're like, okay, now we're in, now we're in history territory, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, there was not... Myth, mythos just means story. Historia right. also means kind of story of a people, yeah. right? These are really the same thing, right, in the ancient world. And so part of the, the what, what causes this problem for modern people is modernism, right? That's why they, they, they have a problem reading Genesis 1 through 11, right? the same way they read 12 through 50 is yeah. because of existing presuppositions that we already have. Right. Um, if you just come to it fresh with no knowledge of anything, you, you would not have any reason to read to suddenly make this jump at chapter 11. Hmm. Right. And allow me to suggest that if what we've said so far on this show is correct, right. You'd really have to split it at chapter nine. Hmm. Right. Because uh, chapter 11 is basically just talking about history the same way like the books of the Kings will. If what we're saying here is correct. So now you got to move it back to chapter nine and you could make a better you could make a better argument for that. You could say, well, see, before the flood, this is a different age. Right. Sort of this view of ages. There's like paradise is an age. Before the flood is an age from the flood to um to christ is an age right you could try that maybe just move it back to nine this maybe maybe i'll turn this into my another version of my conversation with preterists like why don't you just use 135 ad it works better right than 70 anyway um you do the same here maybe divided at nine but nobody does that right they include the tower of babel but 
So if you approach not just Genesis 1 through 11, the scriptures in general, with a definition of truth that's based in modernism, modern materialism specifically, then your definition of truth is what is true is what corresponds to material reality. Right? Um, and so it's, if I had a time machine and a video camera, right, or my phone and somehow magically my cell phone worked in the ancient past without towers um, and not being able to recharge it, and I, I recorded something, right, that happened, that this is what I would see. What is written here on this page is exactly what I would see, right, if I went back and did that. That's our modern sort of materials. They didn't have a concept of time travel, and they didn't have a concept of uh, recording devices in the ancient world. So when we criticize this sometimes, um, I think, and I think this because of comments we get <laughs> when we criticize this, I think some of our listeners hear us saying when we say this, that we somehow don't believe that these things really happened. Or we're saying that the writers of scripture didn't know or didn't care whether these things really happened. Right. Yeah. R really happened, quote unquote. Right. Quote unquote, really happened. Right. Yeah. And, and just that yeah. phrase really happened. You're already in this idea of corresponds to material reality. Right. Um, but, I have no doubt, right, that that if you did have a TARDIS and you went back and you talked to one of the writers of Scripture, it would take you a while to explain your question, frankly, right? Yeah. Like when you said to them, so are these the exact words Moses said? They'd be like, well, I, yeah, I said that's what Moses said. No, no, <laughs> were those the exact words? <laughs> <laughs> but once you explained it to them, what you meant by the question, I'm pretty sure every one of the biblical writers would say yes. Right. Would say, yes, this is what really happened. Yes, this is what actually happened. But that's not what's in their mind as they were writing it. Yeah. That's not how they thought about history. Right. And, and thought about the world. And it's not how they define truth. Right. Because they didn't have the concept of time travel. They didn't have the right. They knew that if you asked eyewitnesses to something to describe what happened and what people said, they wouldn't 100 percent agree. Right. And, and, and so they understood this and they understood that that didn't mean the event didn't happen. Yeah, right? that meant people had different perspectives and they were able to hear different parts and see different parts and were looking from different angles. Right. They, they were actually very sophisticated. Right? And understanding that. Um, but so that's, and, and that's only one definition of truth. That's not the only definition of truth, right? That's not the only definition of truth that we use every day, right? So another common modern definition of truth is basically a utilitarian one, right? What's true is what works, right? So if I come to you, or let's say Shaquille O'Neal comes to you to sell you gold bond medicated cream. Right? <laughs> and he tells you, you, rub this on your knee and it'll help you with your dry uh, knee, right? So you get some and you rub it on your knee, right? If it works, if your knee is less crusty the next day, <laughs> right? Then you will say, yes, what Shaq told me is the truth. <laughs> Right. And that was not in the notes. <laughs> so, <laughs> most of what I say is not in the notes. Well, <laughs> that's usually related to the notes in some way. I wasn't expecting Shaquille O'Neal and Gold Bond. Well, you know, he's everywhere, man. He's like in every <laughs> commercial. He's selling you general car insurance, Gold Bond Minute. Anyway. Yeah. Um, Good for you, Shaq. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> Get your money. Um, so, um, but that kind of utilitarian definition. Right. Again, that we use all the time. Right. There, there's there's some something is either true or false based on whether it actually works. Right. Whether it actually yeah. does what it says on the tin. Right. Um, there's also various philosophical definitions of truth. Like we might say something is true because it expresses some first principle or gives us some insight. 
right, into human behavior or the way society works or the way the world works, right? And we use this all the time when we talk about, right, we read, we, we read a work that we know is fiction, hmm. right? But we say, hey, something this novel said is really true, right? When we say that, we're not claiming that it's not fiction. Right, right. We're claiming that it said something true, or this film or whatever said something true in the sense that it provided some insight, yeah. right, into the way things work. But we're not saying, yes, the events depicted in this film are what really happened at some point to some person, right? Um, the following is based on a true story. <laughs> and based on in that they're both in English. Um <laughs> So all of, all of these examples, right, and we could give more examples of different ways that we, we think of truth, of something being true, right? All of these are really grounded in different, different, different definitions of reality, right? So, again, that idea of corresponding to material reality is based on being a materialist, right? Yeah. That what's real is what's material, is what's... Or that, what, that's only 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 the material is real and everything else right. is something else and yeah. what could be experienced with the senses right yeah. so if i had the time machine this is what i would see happening right? yeah um and you know some of those philosophical definitions right if you ask plato uh or somebody suffering from plato brain right what truth is it's not going to be anything you can see with your senses hmm Anything you can experience with your senses is not really going to be true. Right. What's going to be true uh, is going to be the first principles that underlie, maybe very far removed from the things you experience with your senses. Yeah. Right. All this is just kind of an illusion of sorts. Right. It's a, well, it's a shadow of a yeah, right. yeah, of shadow sorts. of an That's image a, of an right. actual thing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and so, right, they're, they're in these, these different definitions of reality, but these are things we can navigate because we use these different definitions in different circumstances. If you come to me and say, hey, Father Stephen, your house is on fire, right? Yeah. My concern is going to be that this is true in a modern materialist sense, right? <laughs> like, I say, but what do you mean by fire? <laughs> yes, or, or I'm not going to sit and be like, you know, to, to quote what will no doubt uh, go down in history as one of the greatest films of all time. Uh, you'd run into a burning building to save someone you don't even know, but your marriage <laughs> is burning down all around you. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Did you just reference Fireproof? I did. I just quoted oh, Fireproof. Wow. Wow. Uh, this may be our first Kirk Cameron reference in the entire podcast, everybody. Wow. Um, right? Man. Like, I'm not going to be thinking that. That's not where wow. I'm going to go with it, right? Are you talking well, about my marriage? Have I not been caring for my wife adequately? Wow. Right? I'm going to drive to my house and see if it is on fire. Right? Like, literally burning down. That's going to be my immediate concern. Right? That's a, there's not something wrong with that. That doesn't make me a materialist, right? <laughs> the fact that that's going to be my my first in uh, interpretation. So, but what all this means, the reason I'm I'm rambling and ranting about all this, uh, and and quoting Kirk Cameron, uh, that actually wasn't Kirk Cameron. That was Kirk Cameron's friend. That's what he said to him. To, oh, right, to, right. To snap him out of his dogmatic slumber. Um, <laughs> All of this is aimed at, so if we're going to talk about the book of Genesis or any other part of the scriptures, uh, we need to, the question we need to ask is, how is Genesis looking at reality? How is it defining truth? Yeah, yeah, the, Genesis is not simply giving a list of objective facts, um, and and that we should understand that it's not actually an introduction to the whole story of Babylon. It's a response to an existing story that the first listeners and readers would have already known. Like they would have known, oh, he's, they're talking about Babylon. Let's hear this take on it. And it's, and this is the Bible's correction and commentary on what's going on 
with Babylon, with the collapse of that empire, and how that is is to be understood by the people of God. This right. is what God is saying about this. Right. Just like when Genesis 6 starts talking about a flood, none of the original hearers would have been like, oh, there was a flood? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. Everybody knew there was a flood. Everybody knew it wiped out a previous civilization, right? So everybody knew Babylon had been founded, and everybody knew the Babylonian Empire had collapsed, and everybody knew that that was the first in a string of dominoes that read, led to worldwide civilization collapsing, right? They all knew that. Yeah. Right? So this is giving a perspective on it, right? This is giving a perspective on it, of what was actually happening. It's frankly apocalyptic in the sense that we've used it before on the show, in the sense that it's revealing the spiritual reality behind those historical events. Right. Um, and this is part of why it doesn't, the, Genesis 11 doesn't feel the need to give us a date. Yeah. <laughs> right. It doesn't feel the need to give us a ton of geographic locators. This short little text just assumes you all, we all know what's being talked about right right and then we see how it's being characterized yep. but so um babylon isn't just here in genesis at the beginning of the bible as sort of the first empire but babylon is seen as sort of the the principle behind all world empires hmm and we could not only see this along the way through the Bible, but we even see this if we go from Genesis all the way to the end, to Revelation, right? And even near the end of Revelation, right? Uh, there's sort of an ominous, in Revelation 16, verse 19, there's sort of this ominous statement where God remembers Babylon, right? And this isn't like, oh, God had forgotten about it, right? But this is like, now he, it's time for another visit. Okay. Right. And so then in chapters 17 and 18, we have this whole depiction. This is the whore of Babylon that's referred to, um, who uh, sits on, on seven hills like Rome, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> but Wait, what? Is, <laughs> because Rome was the current Babylon. Yeah. Right. Babylon, right. the type. St. Peter represents this. Uh, two references this too, um, but so um, the the and this is this is true for Revelation in general, right? So you know Saint John says in First John, you have heard that an antichrist will come, and already antichrist plural are at large in the world, right? Hmm. Um, so the same thing is true, right? With with Babylon, right? Yes, there will be a last world empire, right? But there's already been a first, and there's a whole bunch in between. And they're all Babylon because they're all founded on that same spirit. Yeah. They're all founded on this idea of uniting humanity, humanity uniting itself toward a common purpose, which is its own glory. And trying to drag God down and put him in service of it. Mm. Okay. So here's my attempt at cancellation number 352. The current <laughs> one is the United States of America. There we are. Am I being canceled already? I, I'm not canceling you, but. <laughs> uh, up until World War II, it was the British Empire. Yeah, I mean the reality is we are the we are the current world empire that's pulling the yeah. most strings and you know right. put yeah. I don't think just... it's going to last much longer if that makes anybody feel any better. Uh, but um, that gives me one fuzzy feeling. Yeah, and <laughs> who knows what happens next, right? Um, All right. Well, and the Brits have already experienced the end of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, uniting the world through trade, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Yeah. Um, so this is, um, but the key here, the key here is that I'm not saying the United States is the last one. I'm not saying it's the ultimate one. I'm not saying, and, and this is part of the problem. Just like people who read Revelation and Daniel not so well want to play pin the tail on the Antichrist, right? 
uh, they want to pay play pin the tail on one world government, right? <laughs> so they almost never pick the United States, though. Uh, <laughs> they usually pick the EU, right? And frankly, I don't know if the EU could run a successful like toothbrush distribution campaign, <laughs> let alone establish a new world order at this point. But okay, All right. um, <laughs> <laughs> but that p- pin the tail on the new world order is not new either right yeah it was napoleon right it was hitler it was stalin it was i mean right all of these right evil empires yeah. of the past have all been right the one right and and none of them yet are the one eventually there will be a last one um but but the point is and the point here is not to uh rag on the United States of America, but to point to what happened after World War II with the ascendancy of the United States economy is that we entered into that imperial position. And so there will always be that temptation, right, for this empire, just like all the other ones, to try to unite humanity around its own glory, to try to sort of demote God to being underneath it and use God for its purposes to justify what it's going to do. Um, and so this is something, I mean, I mean, Rome was doing this while the apostles were alive. At least a couple of them, like St. Paul, were Roman citizens, right? Yeah. So this doesn't mean they were evil, right? This doesn't mean St. Paul stopped praying for the emperor because he decided the whole, you know, Roman Empire was satanic, right? He, he wanted to, right, uh, convert the emperor to Christianity. And that ultimately happened with St. Constantine. And the empire was changed and it crumbled. Bad news for anyone yeah. who doesn't realize the Byzantine Empire fell. Um, it, yeah. And it's interesting that um, one of the marks of of St. Constantine, St. Theodosius's Christianizing of the empire was that after that, neither in the West or the East did the empire actually function as a world empire. Hmm. They weren't actively going out and conquering and consuming, right? The kind of things that were said about the Roman empire before that, right? They've created a wasteland and called it peace. Doesn't really work once you get to the Christian emperors. In fact, that may have been why its days were numbered. <laughs> there right? you go. <laughs> yeah. It was no longer playing by the world's rules. And, yeah. you know. Yep. Yep. A lot all of right. other people still were. Well, all that said, we're going to go ahead and go to our first break. We'll be right back. Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung will be back in a moment to take your calls on the next part of the Lord of Spirits. Give them a call at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. For all of us, male or female, parent or not, that's what it's often like, isn't it? It's at the end of our own tether that the miracle happens. It is in our greatest weakness that God's strength is known. It's when we decrease that he can increase. It's in losing our life that we find it. To put it another way, it's in the spot where St. Morwenna falls down, exhausted that her spring rises up. It's when the people of God curse Moses in the wilderness and wish themselves back in Egypt that they hear the crack of the staff, the gush of water through the rock. It's when God himself is spat upon and mocked and bleeding and dead, that the glorious resurrection is ushered in. From Seven Holy Women, Conversations with Saints and Friends, now available as an audiobook at Audible, Amazon, and iTunes. We're back now with the Lord of Spirits, the Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung. If you have a question, call now at 855-237-2346. That's 855 855- AF Radio. Welcome back, everybody. It's the second part of our show. We're talking about the Tower of Babel. Um, and we just 
I think there was one of our longer, longer first halves, about 90 minutes there. Um, we just went through the whole context of uh, the building of the city and tower of Babylon. Again, Babel equals Babylon in scripture. Um, so now we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit. And we do have a caller waiting, but I think we're going to hold on to that call until the point in this half where uh, what she's asking about makes the most sense. So just hold on, caller. We hear you. We know also, you're there. Also, I, I think I'm supposed to mention I have a new book out, but here's the thing. Oh, yes, you do have a new I book I don't want to say the name <laughs> because that way this podcast will age better because I kind of always have a new book out. I hope that's always going to be the case, Father. So, right, if we don't say the name six months from now, somebody listening to this will be like, oh, Father Stephen has a new book out. And then just whatever it is. Whatever it is. They'll go get it. There we go. And what is new when we're talking about, you know, a cosmic time anyway? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, the writing of books, there is no end. That's Ecclesiastes. That's, yep. Um, All right. <laughs> so, something happens after this event. Uh, after the, the the Babel event, as it were, right? Um, what's 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 going on in connection right. with that? Well, so this this attempt to restore the antediluvian ordering of the world gets ended, right? And something else is given to replace it, right? So the 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 resulting state of affairs is also seen by the Torah to be the product of God's action, right? So um, we see this laid out um, in large part, actually, in Deuteronomy chapter 32. I know there's some folks out there who get excited just mentioning that chapter, um, which is one of the oldest parts of the Torah. Hmm. And, uh, you know, what's funny is that's actually me saying that is probably more likely to get me canceled than, than, uh, saying that the U S is an empire because there's somebody out there going, Moses wrote all of it at the same time. Right. (laughs) Um, but, uh, when I say it's, it's the oldest, right. Again, the Hebrew that the oldest versions of the Torah that we have today is written in did not exist at the time Moses lived. Right. So things have been updated. Things have been translated. Right. It's in a different alphabet. Right. Et cetera, et cetera. So when I say this is one of the oldest portions, I mean, Deuteronomy 32, the other big one is Exodus chapter 15, the Song of the Sea. Hmm. Um, These are the parts of the Torah in Hebrew that uh, show the least sign of editing. (laughs) So... They're in a very antiquated form of Hebrew that's frankly very hard to translate. Yeah, because there's almost nothing else like it out there. Yeah, and yeah, there's a lot of words that are only used here. One of the one of the verses we're gonna about to quote has a verse has a word that's only used here. That's a Babylonian loan word, right? <laughs> it's not even a Hebrew word. Um. So yeah, so that's what I mean by oldest part, meaning oldest in the sense that it's still in sort of its original form, right? It hasn't been edited or updated or smoothed out the way some other sections have yeah, uh, into later Hebrew. Um, so uh, this starts at Deuteronomy 32, verse 8, which we've quoted a bunch on this show. Yep, yep. So, when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. And that's the from the Hebrew version. Um, in the Greek Old Testament, it's according to the number of his angels. Yeah, now that's the, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, Hebrew. Oh, yeah, the sons of God reading. What yeah. you find yeah. in the later Masoretic text is they've edited sons of God into sons of Israel. Hmm. Which makes right. no sense because Israel doesn't even exist at this time. Yeah. So people yeah. just thought the Greek was weird. Well, they would have been the sons of Israel in the sense of uh, like Israel, like Jacob. Oh, okay. Which would give you 12. And then you get some people who do the spe- special pleading of like, well, there's like 70 or 72 people who go down into Egypt at the end of the thing. Wow. Um, 
At the but end this of follows. I mean, this is you know, there is a reference to the number of of the peoples in uh, Genesis yeah. What, ten. Yeah, you've got the table yeah. of nations, and Israel's right. not there. So you got to ignore. Yeah, you got to ignore Genesis ten. You got to ignore how like all the church fathers and all of Second Temple Jew Jewish literature reads this, and you got to say that the Greek translation got it wrong. Yeah. So, but it, if you if you really want to defend a Hebrew text from 1000 AD as being, no, this is the right one. Okay. You know, have fun with that. Um, <laughs> I have no interest in doing that. Uh, right. But so this is the most high God, right? Yahweh gives to when he divides mankind, right? A Tower of Babel, fix their borders according to the numbers of the, the sons of God, of which there were 70 or 72. And as you mentioned, in Genesis 10, we have sort of the table of nations, and there are 70 nations. Um, so this is a side note. Uh, this is me grinding an axe slash <laughs> beating a dead horse. But uh, one of the worst things about English Bibles mostly English New Testaments, is the fact that they use the word Gentiles. Okay. Which is a Latin word. Right. For one thing, so there's no reason to use it. And they're using that to translate the word nations. Yeah. And no. inconsistently. <laughs> right. Because um, sometimes they will translate it as nations. Right. But it both gives this sort of ethnic thing of Jews and Gentiles. Like this is an ethnic issue of peoples, yeah. right? But what that's translating is the phrase nations, which is a reference to like the most accurate translation of that would be pretty much every time you see Gentiles would be to have the 70 nations. Yeah. I mean, it's weird because like Gentile in its um, oldest form simply does mean nations. Like it's related to the word, you know, yeah. the the word gens g-e-n-s which means a kind you know but yeah. i think i think in the medieval period it comes to mean non-jews yeah yeah well it's weird yeah in english in english i mean yeah yeah oh yeah 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 because yeah. like i mean uh, uh thomas aquinas uses that word to mean uh muslims oh yeah that's fun yeah but that's a whole other <laughs> that's yeah. digression but my point being this idea of the 70 nations is what lies behind that. Yeah. Right. It's these 70 nations that were divided. Right. And are out there. Um, and no, I know, I know some of you out there who still have the spreadsheet in your head are thinking, well, wait a minute. Are there still only 70? Did they drop out and like new ones when a new nation forms it? We're not talking about nation states, right? This is symbolic number, right? The idea here is that you have the 70 nations and then you have Israel, which is not a nation in which God creates for himself, right? But the purpose of the creation of Israel as this separate nation is through that nation to save the 70 nations, hmm. right? Um so, yeah, this is, that's a very literal reference to the nations, right? That means, right, the peoples of the world. Um, so then in, uh, that's what we're told happens at the Tower of Babel. Then in Deuteronomy 32, 17, we see that things didn't sort of go as planned. Right. <laughs> right. Or didn't go the way they should have yeah right? a way yes. that would have been better so you get they sacrificed to demons that were no gods to gods they had never known to new gods that had come recently whom your fathers had never dreaded and we should probably say where it says to demons that were no gods to gods they had never known if you read the first part of saying these demons weren't really gods and then it seems like it's talking about two different groups of beings like to demons and then to gods that they had never known. But the point in saying that they were no gods, remember, and we talked about this, I think, in our, our very first couple of episodes, that, that gods in almost every ancient language has this sense of being rulers. They were, they were ruling, right? So the point is, is that these demons are not really the rulers. 
you know, that God is the ruler. Uh, so they're not truly that. But then the verse proceeds to use that exact same word because that's the shorthand word to refer to spirits. Yeah. And the word that's translated demons there in Hebrew is shedim, okay. which is putting a Hebrew plural ending on shedu, which is a Babylonian word for a territorial spirit, meaning a spirit that's the spirit of a particular region or place or geographical feature. Yeah. Right. Um, so they were not supposed to start worshiping the spirits of these places once they got to these places. Right. It's the idea. Um, but that's not sort of the end of the story right yeah. here at Deuteronomy 32, because when we get to verse 43, there's this promise of this reckoning. Yeah. Okay. So this one says, Rejoice with him, O heavens. Bow down to him, all gods. For he avenges the blood of his children and takes vengeance on his adversaries. He repays those who hate him and cleanses his people's land. So, so uh, yeah. bow down to him, all gods. Uh, yeah, of, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> so this is sort of, so within Deuteronomy, the movement of Deuteronomy 32, right, you have the dispersal of, of the peoples into the nations, right? So this attempt at unifying everything is thwarted, right? And things are distributed. But then when they're out there distributed, right, God has pulled himself back away from humanity so humanity won't be destroyed. He appoints these angelic beings, right, to govern and shepherd the nations. But uh, the those nations start worshiping them and start worshiping other spirit, spirits instead of God, right? And so the time is coming when God is going to take revenge on those demonic spirits who have deceived the nations. Yeah, and, and put things back the way they're supposed to be. Right. And that's sort of the, the arc here in Deuteronomy 32. And we're also going to quote again, we've quoted it before on the show, but it's going to be relevant as we go forward tonight. So we're going to just reference it again so people have it fresh in their minds. This is the yeah. comment in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 19. Okay, yeah. So Deuteronomy 4, 19. Beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them, things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. So, yeah, it's this repetition of don't engage in idolatry, and it's this connection, of course, with the gods, with the host of heaven, the, the angelic beings, with, you know, astronomical bodies, right? Um, and there's this reference to this allotment, of all all the peoples under the whole heaven, right. so it's Over it's a kind of a, yeah, yeah yeah exactly all the nations. And so this is the this is the flip side, yeah. right? So Don't because do <laughs> Israel is specially created by Yahweh, the God of Israel, for Himself, right? One of the worst things they could do is for them to be like the nations and start worshiping those other yeah exactly spirits, right exactly. because they're the ones who have sort of direct access. To, yep. to God Most High, through yeah. whom he intends to save those other nations. Yeah, so before we uh, move forward with some of other really interesting quotes that you folks probably out there haven't heard before, we actually have a caller calling in who has a question that's relevant this, to this, and that is a guy with a name that is very similar to yours. His name is Stephen Young. Can you believe it? Stephen Young. Stephen, are you, are you there? Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm here. I am I'm thrilled. I came for the Giants. I stayed for the theology. Um, absolutely love the show. Are Are you the former quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers? No, but um, that was my dad's qu favorite quarterback, and my brother's name is Neil Young, which was his favorite singer. I hope okay. he will remember. It all comes together. That's <laughs> exactly Amazing. Um, you have other brothers named Crosby, uh, Stills, <laughs> and Nash. Please say yes. Um, I, I wish I did. Okay. Aww. <laughs> okay. All right. We, we, we're not going to require that of you. So, Stephen, what is what is your question, comment, concern, uh, accusation? Um, <laughs> um, my question is, um, so obviously have the sons of gods over the 70 nations. So many nations. Um, 
what is to be said about the nations that were outside, like that weren't listed, you know, like, uh, and obviously what I understand it's on nation states, it's more like, you know, different idea than that. Um, but what about the other parts of the world? Did they also have um, uh, a divine being over them? Or is it just like it was these 70 and then they just kind of spread out across the world and the the, pers- the being still looked after them wherever they went? How How would that work? I mean, so, I mean, at least the way that the scripture depicts it is that this is the origin of all humanity because these are the people descended from Noah and his sons, right? So w- what the scripture is, is saying is that this is everybody, okay. right? That, that there aren't other nations out there. Um, now, is it possible that if the flood was not truly, truly worldwide, that there are other nations out there Um I, I don't know, but I mean, that's not what that's not the picture that the scripture is giving. But I do think that even if there are other nations out there, which, again, I don't know, that's just not the, the Bible story, um, that they're included in this exact same dynamic, you know, because if there was some nation out there that w- that remained truly faithful to God, then there would have been no point in creating Israel. Right. Why would sure. God have needed to do that? I don't know, Father. Do you have anything you wanted to add or correct or um, well, actually? Yeah. This is I'll ex- explain a little bit. When I said that that seventy is a symbolic number, right? Um, the idea is that seven, right, represents the whole or completion, and this is because there are seven planets, counting the sun and the moon. Uh, I'm not being facetious. <laughs> the mind of ancient people. There were there were seven planets, including the sun and the moon. And so seven is used. This is where what we now call the menorah comes from, right? The candle stand that was in the uh, temple and the tabernacle that we have on our altar in Orthodox churches. Uh, the reason there's seven lamps is that there were seven lights in the heavens. And the, the, the sun, the moon, and the five planets. Um, and so that represents sort of the whole, it's sort of a representation, a microcosm, right? Literally of the cosmos. Um, and so the reason why the number is set at 70 is not because just objectively there happened to be 70 nations in the world at the time. It's to convey again the, the whole, right? The, the whole world, right? That makes sense. And, um, St. Matthew does something similar to this in his genealogy of Christ, where he has the the 14 generations and then the 14 generations and the 14 generations. So he has like six sevens. And then he, and then Christ is beginning the seventh seven. Right. Um, And sort of bringing it, bringing it all to completion. Right. If you compare his genealogy to the genealogies of the old Testament, in order to get 14, 14, 14, he has to edit a little bit. Right. I get you. But he's wanting to use that symbolic number to convey that meaning. So that's why they kept it to 70, right? Even if they, if, if the, the writers could have listed more, they kept it to 70 to convey that the whole thing. And if you look at the, there's a, a Romanian icon that I know we've posted the, the JPEG of several times um, that uh, depicts this. It shows sort of these people from different nations walking away from the Tower of Babel with angels sort of surrounding their head. Um, and that icon includes a person who's clearly supposed to be Chinese um, and some other people from other nations that aren't listed in the in Genesis 10. Yeah, there's a Native American in that, that icon. Yeah. 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 So does that Thank answer you your question, that. Stephen? Yeah, that absolutely does. And I was atheist for most of my life. And if I would have found uh, orthodoxy earlier on, I would have I would have uh, come on board way earlier. It just it makes so infinitely more sense than than the common Protestantism that that I was hearing in in America. Bless you both, and and have a fantastic night. Thank you very much. All right, moving forward, let's talk about Plato. See, not everything is Plato brain. <laughs> There's some good things to say about Plato. Yeah. I am going to tease Plato a bit at the end of this. But anyway, um, <laughs> right, what's he going to do about it? Um, <laughs> He's cool yeah, with it so, either way. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm a particular person. He doesn't care about me. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> so th- this idea that the nations were divided by the Most High God and that sort of the spirits who govern those nations were sort of assigned to them is not something you only find in the Bible. Uh, this is pretty much how the pagans saw it working also. Uh, and Plato is a really good example of this. Um, and so we're going to go through a couple quotes from Plato where he talks about this in two different places. The first one is in the Critias, which the Critias is the place where Plato talks about the antediluvian civilization. Uh, for Plato, that's Atlantis, yeah, which is this great advanced civilization before it gets destroyed by a flood. How about that? Uh, okay, so this is the Critias, uh, a quote from uh, section 109, B through D. In the days of old, the gods had the whole earth distributed among them by allotment. There, there was is. no quarreling. Yeah, <laughs> allotment, yeah, exactly. There was no quarreling, for you cannot rightly suppose that the gods did not know what was proper for each of them to have, or knowing this, that they would seek to procure for themselves by contention that which more properly belonged to others. They all of them, by just apportionment, obtained what they wanted and peopled their own districts. And when they had peopled them, they tended us, their nurslings and possessions, as shepherds tend their flocks, excepting only that they did not use blows or bodily force as shepherds do, but governed us like pilots from the stern of the vessel, which is an easy way of guiding animals holding our souls by the rudder of persuasion according to their own pleasure. Thus did they guide all mortal creatures. Now different gods had their allotments in different places, which they set in order. Hephaestus and Athena, who were brother and sister, and sprang from the same father, having a common nature and being united also in the love of philosophy and art, both obtained as their common portion this land, which was naturally adapted for wisdom and virtue. And there they have implanted brave children of the soil, and put into their minds the order of government. Their names are preserved, but their actions have disappeared by reason of the destruction of those who received the tradition and the lapse of ages. Right. So he's talking about, you know, Athens. He's talking about Greece, right? Which right. it's interesting to me, he says, are, are uh, uh, what is it, uh, naturally adapted for wisdom and virtue. Yeah, Athens is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. As opposed to, you know, there's no good Spartans and stuff. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, this and, isn't and Sparta. Notice, <laughs> notice also what he's saying about there was no quarreling, right? Or that they they were gentle shepherds and all this, right? He's making these distinctions because those distinctions are referring to this golden age. Yeah. This is the way things used to be. Right? So now, right, Plato knew the Iliad was out there, right? Now the gods go to war with each other over territory, right? Now the gods are gentle is not a good descriptor of many of the Greek gods and their dealings <laughs> with, with humanity, right? Not even a little bit, right? as, as so, we will see next time. <laughs> so he's referring to a, this previous golden age. There was this period of time when these spirits were apportioned out to the nation we had ours and they were gentle and they didn't fight and everything was wonderful but something has changed right for plato yeah. um the other place where he talks about this is in uh, his discourse on the laws uh and i know the plato fans out there the ones that still remain who didn't get mad at me and stop listening uh don't aren't fans of the laws either because uh, it's generally regarded to be the last thing that Plato wrote and to not be very good oh. um, and to probably be unfinished. But uh, the particular piece that, that we're going to read is another place where he talks about this same thing, the same okay. idea, the same golden age and what it okay. was like. All right. So this is Plato again. I must do as you say. Well, then tradition tells us how blissful was the life of men in that age, furnished with everything in abundance and of spontaneous growth. And the cause thereof is said to have been this. Kronos was aware of the fact that no human being, as we have explained, 
is capable of having irresponsible control of all human affairs without becoming filled with pride and injustice. So pondering this fact, he then appointed as kings and rulers for our cities, not men, but beings of a race that was nobler and more divine, namely demons. He acted just as we now do in the case of sheep and herds of tame animals. We do not set oxen as rulers over oxen or goats over goats, but we who are of a nobler race ourselves rule over them. In like manner, the God, in his love for humanity, set over us at that time the nobler race of demons, who, with much comfort to themselves and much to us, took charge of us and furnished peace and modesty and orderliness and justice without stint, and thus made the tribes of men free from feud and happy. And even today, this tale has a truth to tell, namely that wherever a state has a mortal and no God for ruler, there the people have no rest from ills and toils. So, uh, good old Plato, not a big fan of democracy, it turns Yeah, out. right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> People, you know, some beings get to rule because they're just better. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, you wouldn't have an ox lead an ox, would you? Um, <laughs> so, right, but so you can see here, this is the dynamic at Cronus, right? Zeus's father, right, is sort of the, the most high god in this, in this golden age. And he apportions out to the spirits, right, to lead all of these different groups of people so that they could all be happy. And back in the golden age, this leads to them all being happy and having all the things they need and everything is wonderful. That's not where we live anymore. Mm. Right? That's not where we live anymore. So you see both this idea of the the apportionment, but also this kind of golden age view like the the babylonians have and not even connected to the 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 antediluvian world hmm. so now moving on from plato now we'll go to a christian <laughs> right uh this isn't something that's just sort of in the ancient world and then christians just kind of you know eh, babylon whatever right you know. <laughs> gods the nations are demons sure whatever um this is still important when we get into the an important idea uh, once we get into uh, early Christianity. And uh, as just one example, uh, St. Dionysius the Areopagite uh, talks about this uh, in his celestial hierarchies. Okay, so this is St. Dionysius. He says, hence the word of God, and that's capital W, everybody, the word of God has assigned our hierarchy to angels by naming Michael as ruler of the Jewish people and others over other nations. For the Most High established borders of nations according to the number of the angels of God. Deuteronomy 32 reference there. But if anyone should say, how then were the people of the Hebrews alone conducted to the supremely divine illuminations? We must answer that we ought not to throw the blame of the other nations wandering after those which are no gods upon the direct guidance of the angels, but that they themselves by their own declension fell away from the direct leading towards the divine being through self-conceit and self-will and through their irrational veneration for things which appeared to them worthy of God. Even the Hebrew people are said to have suffered the same thing for even over the other nations from whom we also have emerged certain not alien gods were wont to preside, yet there is one head of all, and to this the angels who religiously direct conduct those who follow them. So he's sort of placing the blame on the nations and not on the the angels that governed them. Father Stephen, you still there? Did we lose you? I am. You cut out for a second. Oh, okay. <laughs> It's just a big pause. <laughs> All right. People are panicking. Oh, no. Yeah, I was, I was like, oh, oh, tech, not technical difficulties, I guess. <sighs> oh, our nemesis sees. Yeah, right. um, yeah, I mean, so, so what's that bit about certain not alien yeah. gods, right? What does he mean? Like, those are the gods that were assigned to them. They weren't from somewhere else. Is that what he means by that? Right. So there, there are there are two things that, that happen here, right? So... St. Dionysius wants to make clear that God didn't, like, assign the nations to demons, right? Yeah. 
So what he's not saying is that, oh, yeah, God intended for them to worship Zeus and for these other people to worship Marduk and these other, right? That's not at all, right, <laughs> what he intended, right? That, that these were angels that were assigned, right? And so in one of the next quotes we're going to read, a lengthy one, uh, this is going to be disambiguated a little more, but there are sort of a few different things that happen. So in some cases, and this is in there in, in St. Dionysius as well, the people start worshiping some other spirit other than the angel God assigned. Hmm. In some cases, that angel who was assigned to them falls and accepts their worship. Hmm. Right. And then there's probably other mixed cases, right? You've got giant spirits in there and all right other demonic spirits right but the idea that saint dionysius is trying to get across is that right again god was not saying okay i'm the god of the israelites and these demons are the gods of these other nations right like he gave the nations to a bunch of demons right yeah. gave them away wasn't interested in them right that this is part of his plan for toward ultimately redeeming them, right? right? And that it's the corruption of the people that caused this state of affairs, not God's action that caused this state of affairs. Right, right. So, yeah, and this is why then we get, you know, these references in Scripture to all the gods of the nations are demons, right? Uh, and And then the references in... St. Paul, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, to fighting against powers and principalities, right? And then, again, Psalm 82, which we've talked about many times, you know, God stands, up in, yeah, yeah. God stands up in the council of the gods and renders judgment. It kind of reads off a list of charges and then, and then destroys them at the end as he rises, right. as he arises from the dead. He arises uh, to judge you and inherit from all of the nations. Right. Yeah, right, exactly. that's sort of the psalm dramatizes what was already promised in Deuteronomy 32, 43. And then, of course, we celebrate the fulfillment of that on Holy Saturday as Christ yeah. uh, rises from the dead. And all authority in heaven and on earth is given to him. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So, OK, well, we have another caller and uh, we have Celeste on the line and she wants to ask about these fallen angels. So, Celeste, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Welcome to the Lord of Spirits podcast, Celeste. What exactly is on your mind? Thank you. Okay, so I'm thinking about the crystallized state you first spoke about during your first episodes on the falls of men and angels. And I don't understand how if we determine um, by our own lives whether we are, so to speak, goats or sheep at our death and Christ merely separates us, how does praying for the repose change um, the repose from goats to sheep? And when does the crystallization happen? All right. All right, Father Steve, I'm going to let you go ahead and just take this one first. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah. So um, I thought you were going to ask a different question, but this question no. <laughs> than the one I thought you were going to ask. So I'm glad this is the one you asked. Um, right. So, um we are able during our lives to repent, right? To ourselves take the action of uh, that actions are required that lead to us being purified from sin, purified from its effects, healing from its consequences, setting things right that we set wrong. Once we are no longer in the body and no longer in this world, then we ourselves can't do that, right? So I myself, if I uh, pass away and I go to Hades, in Hades, right, I can't fix what I broke, right? I can't come and, uh, and apologize and ask forgiveness from someone, right? I can't uh, repent and change right my life myself at that point right but we have to take into account that from our perspective right like our 
living human perspective, uh, the uh, last judgment, that sorting, hasn't happened yet. Right? Um, and that Christ's relationship to time and our relationship to time is totally different. Right? And so, in the same way that my prayers now might be what God uses to say, heal someone who I'm praying for, right? Um, my prayers now might be something God uses in potentially the past from my perspective, right? To bring someone to repentance, to shape the course of their life, uh, and additionally, right, since that separation hasn't happened, right, that separation is up to Christ. Christ is the one who judges everyone, right, and who makes that distinction and that separation. People who I think look like goats may actually be sheep and vice versa, right? But Christ is the one who knows that. So there's a mystery here, right? And part of that mystery is that there's not sort of this bar Right. This is one of the differences with Western theology. In Western theology, there kind of is a bar. Uh, in Orthodox theology, there's not really a bar where you hit that bar and now you're on the saved side. And if you don't make that bar, now you're on the damned side. And so you either have to hit that bar before you die or our prayers or actions need to do something to help you hit that bar after you die. But there's, there's no bar. Right. Um, everyone is on a continuum, right, between Christ and inhumanity. And we don't know or have any basis to draw a line somewhere on that continuum that says uh, blessed on one side and condemned on the other how exactly Christ is going to do that is known only to him, right? Uh, and so we all pray for each other and we do that continuously because all of us need the grace of God and the support of each other working together to try to continue to draw closer to Christ, thereby become more human instead of less human, be cleansed of our sins. Um, and so... Uh, all the TLDR on that is you're kind of asking me how prayer for the departed works and there's not really a way that things work. We just know that it does, <laughs> right? There's not like a mechanism, right? That we can get at of how it works. Right. But we know that our prayer for the departed is a continued expression of our unity with each other. Right. And and a continued manifestation and furthering of our union with Christ. Yeah. Right. And even if it doesn't even if it doesn't quote unquote work, right? Even if our prayers for someone who's departed end up in the final analysis, and may this not be so, but even if it ends up in the final analysis that we just really loved and prayed with tears for people who end up not loving God, well, that makes us a lot more like Christ because we're told that God wills that none should perish. And so Christ himself desires the salvation of a whole bunch of people who won't have it, don't want it. Does that make sense, Celeste? Does that help? It was an awesome answer. Thank you very much. Great. It's always good when you're awesome, Father Stephen. Thank you for calling, Celeste. I good guess. to hear from you tonight. Thanks for waiting, by the way. Thank you very much for waiting. All right. Moving forward, everybody's favorite semi-Aryan from the 4th century. <laughs> Eusebius well, of now, Okay, now oh, I got okay, sorry. Think. Now I got to think. <laughs> oh, do you have a See, you have one that's more favorite? I don't know. I don't know. I got to think I don't, for a minute. I mean, I don't, from, I don't from keep the 4th century A.D., yeah, because my favorite semi-Aryan is Philo of Alexandria. Right, <laughs> right. He's he's first century, first century BC. BC. Yes, BC. that's right. Like some of these ranking things, right? Like I somebody know. asks, "Who's your favorite Nazi?" It's always going to be Martin Heidegger, right? But <laughs> you try and go wow. below that, 
and it gets really tough because you wow. have to try and think of another Nazi that's at all worthwhile. Wow. Right. <laughs> Carl Schmidt. I don't know. But anyway. Um, wow. That ought to get me canceled if that, nothing else does today. Uh, right. But yeah. So yeah, probably. Okay. I'll, I'll give you Eusebius of Caesarea favorite semi-Aryan of the four. <laughs> okay. He's better than Eusebius of Nicomedia. So. Right. Yeah. Not that guy. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, Eusebius of Sicily, of course, is mostly known as a church historian. That's his kind of main value to the church, right? But he has some other writings, um, including one called The Demonstration of the Gospel. And we're going to go through a kind of a long quote from that, uh, which I'm going to read parts of it to you. And then Father Stephen will stop me and we'll talk about bits here and there. Okay. Right. right. Well, and so why are we, why are we doing this? Yes. Right? Yes. People out there will be going, why? Why are you doing this? Um, <laughs> The, the reason why is uh, I've referred to this text a bunch. I've referred to it on the show. I referred to it in Religion of the Apostles. I refer to it a bunch of places. I'm pretty convinced no one has actually looked it up and read it. <laughs> <laughs> Just find how many times I refer to it. Um, and this is worth knowing about for reasons we'll see as we go through. Also, last time I talked about when I was talking about St. Augustine, and the expulsion from paradise and quote unquote, the fall, right? I mentioned this text again, um, because I said, you know, different authors, early Christian authors, uh, will tend to focus on one of the, what we're calling the three falls. We'll tend to focus on one of them and make that one sort of it, right? The main right. thing, right? Um, even though they'll acknowledge the other ones. So, for example, St. Augustine famously, and this had a vast effect on Western theology, focuses everything in on the expulsion from paradise, sin gets attached, everything gets attached to that. But he also, as we talked about last time, Cain is a fundamentally important figure to sit the city of God. Right? Mm, so he doesn't yeah, like right. deny this other stuff outright. Right? Yeah. It's just yeah. he thinks one is the main focus. So Eusebius of Caesarea specifically in this lengthy quote we're going to work our way through now, uh, he is making the Tower of Babel the big event. Yeah. He's not denying the expulsion from paradise. He talks about it. He's not denying the flood. He talks about it. But for him, the big fall, the capital F fall, is here at the Tower of Babel episode. Right. And, and you know, just as a note, folks, just as we quoted Plato, who's not a Christian, and did not say, you know, he's some kind of church father. Uh, when we quote Eusebius of Caesarea, we are not saying, and so there he, therefore he's a saint and infallible. You know, we're we're saying here is a witness to this view. That's what we're. Just, that's yeah. I just compared semi Aryans to Nazis. Okay? <laughs> like, <laughs> I am not promoting semi Aryans <laughs> or the tenets of National Socialism. Just to be clear, even though it is an ethos, I do um, kind of like Heidegger. But oh yeah, but for other not. reasons, yes, yeah, yes, <laughs> yes for right. radically different reasons. Yes, exactly, exactly. All right, okay. So well, let's begin with from uh, Eusebius's text, demonstration of the gospel. Into this truth, Moses, the first mystic theologian, initiated the Hebrews of old, saying, "Ask thy father, and he shall announce to thee thine elders, and they shall tell thee." When the Most High divided the nations, when he distributed the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the nations according to the number of the angels of God. His people Israel became the portion of the Lord. Israel was the line of his inheritance. In these words, surely so he named... By the way, oh, go ahead. that's Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9 that he just quoted from the Greek. Yeah. 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 In these words, surely he names first the Most High God, the Supreme God of the universe, and then as Lord, his word, whom we call Lord in the second degree after the God of the universe. There's his semi-Arianism. Yeah, there's, there's warning sign number one. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. And their import is that all the nations and the sons of men, here called sons of Adam, were distributed among the invisible guardians of the nations, that is, the angels, by the decision of the Most High God, and his secret counsel unknown to us. Whereas to one beyond comparison with them, the head and king of the universe, I mean, to Christ himself, as being the only begotten son, was handed over that part of humanity denominated Jacob and Israel, that is to say, the whole division which has vision and piety. Uh, which means, another yeah, positive. exactly. Yeah, there's... So 
if you if you remember the quote from Saint Dionysius the Areopagite, Saint Dionysius repre uh, references Daniel, in which right it talks about the uh, the Prince of Persia, right, and the the Prince of Greece, and then they say, and Michael, your prince, right. So he references the fact that Saint Michael the Archangel was the sort of guardian angel of Israel. And you may have just noticed that Eusebius says that Jesus is the one who's appointed. Right. So there's another another bit of semi-Arianism. But that's yeah. not the point of, <laughs> that's not why we're quoting this. But we're just pointing that out. Those and are some maybe, problematic maybe, passages. Just quickly, right? What makes him a semi-Arian and not a full-on Arian? <laughs> right? The distinction here is that for him... We cut out, we're not reading, I mean, obviously, this is going to be a long quote, but this isn't even all of book four of the demonstration of the gospel. Um, so at the beginning of book four, he talks more about the relationship between the father and the son. And so, and that's why he says here that, that can at the same time sort of equate Jesus with the archangel Michael and say that, that Christ is beyond comparison with the angels is that he believes that essentially that Christ came into being, but was not created. Hmm. He believes he, he came into being from the essence of the father. Yeah. Which but is that he came into being within time. Weird. Yeah. Right. That's what makes him a semi Aryan. And that's why Philo of Alexandria, the Jewish author, is basically a semi-Aryan because he believes that the Logos and the Spirit uh, were sort of made by God out of himself. Hmm. Rather than being created the way other things were created, but that still come into being within time. So that's why he's a semi-Aryan. He is wrong. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah. this is not Nicene Christology. But even though his Christology is not what we would want, right, um, it's important to see here, again, that and he's, he's citing Deuteronomy, right, mm -hmm. that these ideas, these traditions are current in the fourth century in Christianity. Mm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Moving forward. More Eusebius from the same passage. But the angel guardians and shepherds of the other races allowed them, inasmuch as they were not able with their mind to see the invisible, nor to ascend so high through their own weakness, to worship things seen in the heavens, the sun and moon and stars. For these indeed, being the most wonderful of the things of the phenomenal world, invited upwards the eyes of those who see and as near as possible to heaven, being as it were in the precincts of the king's court, as near as possible to heaven, being as it were sorry, I'm repeating myself, manifesting the glory of him that is the source of all by the analogy of the vastness and beauty of created visible things. For in exhorting the portion of the Lord to grasp with clear mind and pure soul that which is known to the mind only and unembodied, he prohibits all terror of the things seen in heaven, adding that the Lord thy God has divided them for all the nations. When he says he prohibits the terror, he means don't worship those things in heaven, yeah. Right, and that's Deuteronomy 4.19 that he just right. quoted. Right, exactly. Yeah. And it is worth realizing why he says that they were divided. Since unseen by us, they that bear the earthy and demonic nature are everywhere wanderers, flying through the air around the earth, unknown and undistinguished by men, and the good spirits and powers, and indeed the divine angels themselves are ever at variance with the worse, there was but one way for those who failed of the highest religion of the Almighty to prosper, namely to choose the best of things visible in heaven. For there was no slight danger, lest seeking after God and busy with the unseen world, they should turn towards the opposing demonic powers amid the stress of things obscure and dark. Yeah, Such and was their position. Notice, notice um, he makes these references to earthy and demonic nature. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So just to clarify what that is, remember the word yantes, right, giants in Greek, literally means one's born of earth. One's born of Gaia, actually, right? Because that's where they come from, Gaia, like the goddess, the earth, right? Um, so he's distinguishing there the demonic would be 
fallen angels, the earthy would be uh, basically the spirits of dead giants. Right. Hmm. So you have this overarching category of unclean spirits. Right. And he's just sort of distinguishing these two types. Yeah. When he mentions these earthy spirits, that's what he's talking about. Yeah. Okay. All right. Moving forward. I'm going to lose my place here. <laughs> the way this is translated is... You're at such after yeah, the ellipsis. Yeah, such. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. While those on the side of the opposing rebel power were either demons or vile spirits immersed more or less in wickedness... <laughs> I love that line. Yeah. They're immersed more or Way less in wickedness. In wickedness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. With the cunning ruler of them all, the, the cunning, cunning ruler of them all, the mighty demon who first failed of their reverence of the divinity and fell from their own portion. That's, that's the devil. When envy of man's salvation drew them the contrary way, plotting with all sorts of evil devices against all the nations and even against the Lord's portion and their jealousy of the good. Right. So notice the envy and jealousy language about the devil. Yep. Yep. Right. In, in motivating his fall. And how he says, right, he decides to go after the nations, the 70 nations, and even after Israel itself, right? Which he's calling yeah. the Lord's portion. Yeah. 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 All right. These are the words of God's antagonist, boasting in the strength of his wickedness, as he threatens to steal and obliterate the divisions of the nations delivered by the Most High to the angels, and loudly cries that he will spoil the earth and shake the whole race of men and change them from their former good order. Let and me, in this let way, me oh, go ahead. Add, let me add there. So it's a, when you said these are the words. So believe it or not, I know this is long that we're reading through. It's <laughs> actually is. way longer. I cut out little bits. Um, yes. There's ellipsis. And the bit that was cut out before these are the words is actually he quoted Isaiah. He quoted mm. the devil in Isaiah, uh, yeah. saying that he would remove the boundaries of the nations. Yeah. yeah. Right. And despoil the whole earth. And so yeah. he lit on that, remove the boundaries of the nations, right? The order that God established after Babel, he wants to destroy that order. Yeah. Yeah. So then that's why the next thing he says, and in this way, he took the whole world and held it captive and obliterated the boundaries of the nations. I mean, this is this imperial drive. Right. The idea of yeah. empire, right? You, you obliterate those boundaries, unite everything under yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And from that day forward, he ruled all men with deceit. And the evil demons were arrayed under their king in every place and city and land. And thus the whole of human life was enslaved by earthly powers and evil spirits. Instead of the earlier ministers of God, they that were their guardian angels before were unable to defend in any way the subject nations now involved in such a flood of evil. They took care of the rest of the created world. They guarded the other parts of the cosmos and served according to their want, the will of God, the creator of all. But they did not realize the fall of mortal men through the undetermined human choice of evil. Right. So there he makes the same point, say, St. Dionysius did, right? That, that it was humans who caused everything to go bad, yeah. right? And he says that the, the angels who remained faithful to God sort of weren't able to do anything about this, right? Mm. So those other angels had to sort of retreat to taking care of other parts of the cosmos, yeah, right, that were still obedient to God, like everything other than humans. Yeah, there's this tradition I know of amongst um, Greek Orthodox Christians that, um, and maybe exists in other places too, but I've always heard this from Greeks, that when the angelic rebellion began, that the archangel Michael said, stop. Uh, and um, which is why anyone, and I know we have at least one listener out there named Stamatios, uh, uh, which is, comes from the Greek word that means stop, um, which is why someone named Stamatios, their, their name day is um, the Feast of the Archangels. So it's this idea of like, they, they can't, make the demons stop they just they're going to do what they're going to do right yeah and so they have to right but and this is a theme a lot in the psalms is that right you know the the stars all stay in their courses and right all of the sort of elements of the natural world all sort of obey god's commands it's just humans who are the problem mm, yeah right and so yeah. that's sort of part of the idea here is that the angels go and start taking care of everything other than the humans because 
Because the humans, humans are, are so rebellious saying, and wicked, no. they can't do anything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, moving on. Wherefore a great, uh, sorry, wherefore a sickness great and hard to heal overcame all on the face of the earth. The nations being driven now one way, now another by the evil spirits and falling into a depthless abyss of evil. Yea, now some thought it good to feast on the bodies of their dearest, like wild beasts that devour the raw flesh of men, and to lie shamelessly with mothers, sisters, and daughters to strangle their old men and cast their bodies to the dogs and birds. Why should I recall the cruel and terrible human sacrifices of the gods, I mean the evil demons, into which they maddened the human race? Right. And so awful. these things he lists aren't just horrible things, right? You may yes. recognize them from giant stuff, right? Yes. Totally. Right. As the stuff the giants did. But these are the, the point here is not just that they did these horrible acts of murder and incest and and uh, and human sacrifice, but that all of these things were related to, right? The strangling of people and casting their bodies into to animals or into bogs. Um Right. Mm -hmm. These are all things that these demonic spirits demanded as sacrifices from the nations. Right. These yeah. these demons that they were worshiping as gods. Yeah. All right. We're getting close to the end, everybody. But it was when evils of such magnitude had fallen on the whole world from the wicked and vile spirits and their king. And none of the guardian angels was able to defend them from the evils that he, God, the word, the savior of the universe, by the goodwill of his father's love to man that the human race so dear to him might not be seethed in the gulf of sin, sent forth at last some few and watery rays of his own light to shine through the prophet Moses and the godly men before and after him, providing a cure for the evil in man by the holy law. These and many other holy teachings and commands God the Word gave to them of old by Moses as delivering the elementary truths at the entry of the life of holiness by means of symbols, and worship of a shadowy and external character in bodily circumcision and other things of that kind which were completed on the earth. But since as time went on, none of the prophets who succeeded Moses had the power to cure the evils of life owing to the excess of wickedness, and the activity of the demons daily waxed greater, so that even the Hebrew race was hurried along in the destruction of the godless. At last, the Savior and Physician of the universe comes down himself to men, bringing reinforcement to his angels for the salvation of men, since the Father had promised him that he would give him this boon. And so right. that's why, according to Eusebius, this is why Christ comes into the world, to deal right. with this big demon problem. Right, because, uh, and so, so the way he presents the Torah and the Old Testament scriptures, but specifically the Torah, is that, this comes, first of all, it comes from Christ, according to Eusebius, but that he he gives it into the world to try and preserve, right, his portion, to preserve Israel, right, uh, from, right, the, what the demons have done to all the nations. But uh, it's, the, the Torah is powerless to sort of take care of this demon problem, right, at best, it can kind of preserve Israel, right? As this sort of little bastion, right? Um, but it can't solve the problem at all. And not only could it not solve the problem, but Israel didn't keep it. And so they more and more started falling under the sway of the same demonic spirits, right? Yeah. And so the only solution, this is here the gospel, as, as Eusebius sees it, is that Christ comes to defeat those demons. Yep. yep. And liberate the nations. Amen. All right. Well, with that, we're going to take our second break, and we will be right back in just a second. Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung will be back in a moment to take your calls on the next part of the Lord of Spirits. Give them a call at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. New from Ancient Faith Publishing. Secret Turning, a collection of short stories by Stephen Signori. So I'm out in the lot of Little Heaven, and up comes Father Naum from behind, grabs me, gives me a kiss, and tells me he's happy to see me. 
wearing his worn-out dungaree bib overalls with the beat-up straw Stetson, pulling his wire basket, going shopping on the avenue. How old is Naum, anyway? Sharky asked. Older than he acts, Lefty said. Two beer ready, said, yeah, and younger than he seems. So he says to me, Theodri, the church is much better when you're there. It's not the whole family when we don't see you. You know, God misses his children. And Nana Olga misses her son. Now available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook at store.ancientfaith.com. We're back now with the Lord of Spirits, with Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung. If you have a question, call now at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. All right, welcome back. It's the third half of our third episode in this three-part series on the fall of man. We're talking about the Tower of Babel and everything that happened as a result of that. Okay, well... You know, our... uh... (laughs) Our friend Aristotle told us that everything that comes in threes is perfect. Oh, so this maybe we we should just end the entire show, the entire this, podcast. This is therefore the tonight. perfect episode. Yeah, By it's a third of a standards, and this is the perfect half of that episode of of that episode because it's, it's the, the third the, one. The third half of the third episode. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Have we done so, a three series? Is this the third series? Done? I don't know. I have I haven't checked actually. We have had a few series though. So, all right. Extra perfect. Extra most perfect. <laughs> the third of thirds. So, all right. Well, we in our first uh, first half, we talked about the Tower of Babel in the city of Babel, Babylon itself. And then the second half, we talked about the the gods of the nations, right? These allotment of the nations and the, the downfall of them and how Christ came to, among other things, to defeat them, right? So... All right, so uh, how are we going to wrap this one up, one up, Father? Where can we go from here? Well, we're going to talk about now another set of allotments that uh, it turns out are related. Uh, and that is the land allotments in the Torah, which I know is everybody's favorite part of the Pentateuch. Oh, yeah, big time. Uh, but mainly <laughs> just the people who publish Bible maps. Yeah. Um, it's like the so, geography it's like the geography chapter in the Silmarillion like no one loves that chapter except for the people who make their own maps of Beleriand yeah. uh, like our cartography people man there's yeah. a dude out there who's an expert on 16th century maps yeah yeah. I mean I love that stuff I always loved cartography when I was that. young Yeah, yeah. I always yeah. pulled out the maps from the National Geographic and put them on my walls this is the thing with academia man <laughs> If you want to study, you could spend your whole life studying, you know, late antique Roman textiles, right? 16th century maps, right? Whatever you're into, man. Like, that's perfectly legitimate if that's what you want to devote your life to. Uh, But we're we're not going to all play ball that it's, like, relevant to anything. (laughs) You do you. Oh, come on, man. You do you. Whatever you're into, man. It's cool. But... (laughs) You know, 16th century maps probably would not work as a pitch for a new podcast on Ancient Faith Radio. I don't know. I, I could you know, kind of try to come up with an something. audio podcast. Yeah. I mean, describing maps. Im- imagine, in audio if you form. will. <laughs> and 33 kind of degrees like to Jersey. the northwest. This yeah. The top that looks like New Jersey. And then, like, you follow, <laughs> like. All right. <laughs> Enough digression. All right. Land allotments. Yeah. And, yeah. and by the way, yes, we were just saying we will never do an episode on the Piri Reyes map. Um, no. So uh, land allotments in the Torah, right? So probably the more well-known of those, and I say more purely as a comparative, right, would be uh, the pieces of land within Canaan that were allotted to the different tribes, um, and I say that purely as a comparative because, again, not a lot of people jumping up and down uh, with love for the Book of Numbers. Um, but uh, there were particular pieces of land, right, designated for each tribe, right, in in the area of Canaan. Um, 
And even if you've never poured over the maps that get produced of this, of where they were supposed to be, uh, you may be aware of that. You may also be aware of the fact that the Levites did not get a piece of land. The Levites' inheritance, their allotment is God himself, right? right? And that was a way of conveying what we've talked about before, that in, in Israel there's sort of concentric circles, right? And the closer you are to God, like the higher level of purity you had to maintain, right? So Israel was called to a higher level of purity than the nations, and then the priesthood within Israel was called to a higher level of purity than the rest of Israel, and then the high priest is called right to the highest level of purity because they're how close they were going to be to the the presence of God, right? But so they have an allotment; it's just not land, right? And so right. they got their food and clothing and support from the people of the other tribes when they came to uh, worship and and offer sacrifices. Um, but these these allotments. And the boundaries of these allotments are considered by the Torah to be set in stone. Hmm. Uh, meaning that hypothetically, every 50th year, when you get to a Jubilee year, right? So every seven years, you have a Sabbath year. And then after seven sevens, you have the 50th year. That's the Jubilee year. One of the things that happens in the Jubilee year is that all of the land reverts back to the, the tribes and clans that originally had those allotments. Right. There's a big, a big resetting of all the boundaries, and anyone who rented a property or brought, bought a property, it goes back. Back to these original boundaries and, and this original order. Um, now, we know from the text of the Old Testament that Israel never actually did this. There was never yeah. a single jubilee year, right, that they actually celebrated. They didn't even ever do the Sabbath year. Wow. Um, and we know that because uh, Jeremiah gets told that uh, the reason the exile was going to last for 70 years is that Israel had been in the land for 490 years and had never celebrated the Sabbath year. So God was taking all 70 of his Sabbath years at once. Wow. That they owed him. Wow. Um, so, and if they weren't doing the Sabbath year, they definitely weren't doing Jubilee, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but, uh, so... Um, those are said so less well known because for various reasons uh related to uh the beliefs of certain segments of american evangelical christianity um we think we only think about israel when we think about descendants of abraham this included there were land allotments made by god to the other descendants of abraham hmm. so so uh, Edomites, uh, some other people? Edomites, Moabites, Ammonites. Okay. And if you don't believe me, or you're just interested in reading more about it, go to Deuteronomy chapter 2. The Edomites are mentioned in and around verse 5. The uh, Moabites are mentioned in and around verse 9. The Ammonites are mentioned in and around verse 19. It's reiterated there that obviously the Edomites are descended from Esau. But uh, the Moabites and the Ammonites are Lot, descended from Lot, Abraham's nephew, part of his, his family. And in all three cases, as the Israelites are approaching Canaan to take the land that he's allotted to them, at least in theory, uh, God says you're not to touch these people. You're not to touch their land. You don't get a single foot of it. Yeah, yeah. Right. If you, I just looked at the verses, and it's basically like, don't invade them, don't harass them, because I gave them that land. Right. God gave them that land, and part of him giving them that land, right, he allots them the land, and then what they're required to do is to go in and drive out the giant clans. And if you read in Deuteronomy chapter 2, in all three of those cases, it then lists the giant clans who are driven out before those Abrahamites. Right. Uh, the Philistines are also included in there, even though they're Greek. Hmm. But that's a whole other thing. Yes. Uh, all the Greeks in Israel, we'll talk about another time. Um, so, uh, but so the, the idea is, right, and this is, this is part of where the folks I mentioned a few minutes ago stumble, 
right, is that they look at the promises to Abraham regarding the land, and it's this huge swath of land. And they say, well, Israel never had all that land, right? But again, read closely, that promise wasn't, that, that land, big swath of land wasn't promised to Israel. It was promised to Abraham's descendants. Mm. And if you put together all of these land allotments, guess what you find out? Yeah, that's the borders. That's, that's, that's where it went. And so Israel are the latecomers, right? When they show up in Canaan, in Deuteronomy, right, at the end of the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, these other Abrahamites already have their land. They've already driven out the giants, so they already have their land. So now it's up to them, and this is what the book of Joshua is about, it's up to them now to go and take their allotments and drive out the giants before them. And even though a bunch of the tribes don't go to their allotments, they go somewhere else like Dan, or they don't completely take the land they're supposed to take, or they let some of the giants get away, right? Even though they do all that, when we get to the end of Joshua, the book of Joshua says that all those land promises were fulfilled. Hmm. Yeah. None of them are actually, outstanding. They're all fulfilled. Right. It's been done. Like this is not something in the future. Yeah. So like Joshua eleven twenty three. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had spoken to Moses, and Joshua gave it for an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal allotments, and the land had rest from war. And then Joshua 21, verses 43 through 45, Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it, and they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one of all their enemies had, had withstood them, for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. All the right. promises were fulfilled. Right. So there are no land promises to any ethnic nation of anybody still outstanding from the book of Genesis. There we go. Highlight that. Put stars around it. Sorry to our dispensationalist friends. Yes. Support your Palestinian brothers and sisters in Christ. Anyway. Amen. Um, so... Right, so that's all done, right? But so what was that about anyway? Especially since it's all done, right? Well, yeah. we've, I know, we've mentioned on the show before when we were talking about Abraham that these land promises, and this is the way, like, St. Paul's Epistle to the Hebrews interprets it, right? Is that the land, the physical land, was a sign, right? So it's very common in prophecy in the Old Testament, and even sometimes in the New Testament, that there is a physical and immediate sign that people will see that serves as the guarantee that the larger prophecy will come true. Yeah, kind of down payment. Right. And so when you see this first part come true, then you'll know that the rest of it is true. Right? So in a lot of ways, right, Genesis, remember, is part of the Torah. So we get the promises to Abraham in Genesis. By the end of the Torah, and if you throw in Joshua as the Hexateuch especially, but even if you don't, you see the fulfillment of the sign, Israel coming into the land that was promised, right? That first part being kept. That's what you see in the Torah. The rest of the Torah is basically that being fulfilled, the sign being fulfilled which is then a, causes the Torah as a whole to function as a pointer toward the eventual fulfillment of the larger promise. So what's the larger promise? Well, the larger promise pretty well parallels what happened in driving out the giant clans and receiving the allotted land, right? Because the promise to Abraham, and it, it's reiterated several times, but in Genesis 15, 5 in particular, Right, It says that they will be in number, his descendants will be in number like the sand of the sea, and they will be like the stars of heaven. Right. right. So the stars of heaven there are used qualitatively. 
And we've laid this out in previous episodes, right? This is right. how Philo interprets it. This is how everybody interprets it. But just for tonight, if you want somebody who interprets it that way, Daniel, right? It's the prophet Daniel in Daniel 12, verse 3, right? In talking about the resurrection of the dead, says, And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Yeah. Right? So that's how he reads it. So... Your offspring are going to become like the stars of heaven, which we've already seen are sort of connected to the angelic realm, right? And then Genesis 22, verse 17 adds, when those promises are reiterated, adds this extra element, right, of, uh, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, right? And possess is the translation that got cut and pasted here. But the, the original Hebrew word kind of means camp, Hmm. Right? They'll dwell in the gates of their enemies. So the gate is the place where you fended off attacks from your city. So if somebody is, if, if they're camping in your gates, well, you lost, bud. Yeah, <laughs> right? Right. Like they've come in and taken over your city, right? Yeah. So they're going to become like the stars of heaven. They're going to defeat these enemies, right? And so the land is this sign the fulfillment right the bigger promise is that the descendants of abraham the sons of abraham those who are like abraham who are faithful they are going to ultimately become gods become like the angelic beings become sons of god and are going to replace those fallen angelic beings right who are the gods of the nations they're going to take their roles yeah exactly Exactly. So yeah. So to that to that end, uh, you mentioned Philo of Alexandria earlier. So we have a quote from Philo, and um, I think we've quoted this one before, but it's relevant yeah. again to what we're talking about here. This is from his Special Laws, um, one, part three. I don't know if that's chapter one or book one, but anyway, one part. Book three. one, part three. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Uh, he writes this, Some have supposed that the sun and moon and the other stars were gods with absolute powers and ascribed to them the causation of all events. But Moses held that the universe was created and is, in a sense, the greatest of commonwealths, having magistrates and subjects. For magistrates, all the heavenly bodies fixed and wandering. For subjects, such beings as exist below the moon, in the air, or on the earth. These magistrates, however, in his view, do not have unconditional powers, but are lieutenants of the one father of all. And it is by mimicking the example of his governance, exercised according to law and justice over all created things, that they acquit themselves aright. So all the gods which the senses know in the heavens must not be supposed to possess absolute power, but to have received the rank of subordinate rulers, naturally liable to correction. Let us proceed to give honor to the immaterial, invisible, understood by the intellect alone, who is not only the God of gods, whether perceived by sense or by mind, but also the maker of all. Right. So what the angels are doing, right, is not just that some of them were governing the nations, but they're governing all these aspects of the cosmos. They're part of God's sort of administration. As lieutenants, magistrates, right. yeah. right. And so they are sort of actively engaged with the cosmos, ruling elements of it, right? Guiding elements of it, right? They are not capital G gods. They're not like God in that sense, right? But Philo, who's a Jewish person of the first century BC, has no problem calling them gods. Right. We I would mean, say small g. Right? It's, it's in the Bible. So he's just using right. biblical language. Right. And so... Right. This is the role that those angelic beings had. This is the role then in which humans are going to replace them. And we see this play out all over the place in the New Testament as yeah. theosis is, is described. Right. Exactly. What this concretely means. Exactly. Right? So in, in Matthew 19, 28 and Luke 22, verse 30, parallel passages, the apostles receive this promise that they're going to sit on 12 thrones and judge the 12 tribes of Israel right, as their reward for what they've given up, right, the things they've given up in this life, right? Um, 
in uh, Revelation 3, 21, at the beginning of the book of Revelation, there are these letters to the seven churches, and each one of them sort of concludes with a promise to the one who overcomes, right? The yeah. one who conquers, who overcomes. And, and this one, Revelation three twenty one, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. It was that co-ruling uh, image again. Right. And uh, Revelation 4.4, 4, right, you see the 24 elders who are sitting on 24 thrones, right, yep. governing. And it's not a coincidence that there are 24 of them because 24 is one third of 72. Yeah. And in, in this case, 72 represents the angelic governors of the nations, uh, and so the idea is that, you know, and as it says in Revelation twelve four, it says that a third of the stars fall out of heaven because they're swept out by the tail of the dragon. Um, now, we should say that that doesn't mean that only a third of the nations fell. That's not what that means. Right. The number is getting repurposed here. Yeah, guys, don't spreadsheet this. OK, yeah, this is not yeah. saying there's only 24 saints. This is not saying. Right, there were... exactly. There yeah. were only 24 demons who fell, right? That's not, right? Yeah. And if there's we're any question... the third, the proportion is yeah. what we're trying to... And, that they're and, the same proportion. And, and if there's any question in people's minds about these 24 elders, whether these are humans, the song that they sing before the throne of God, one of the things that they say is, you have redeemed us out of every nation. Yeah. That's humans. That's only humans. Yeah. That could, that's, that's not angels. Yeah. 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 Right. And so then in both and in both Revelation 510 and 20 verse four, it talks about uh, those who are uh, participate in the resurrection uh, reigning with Christ. Right. Yeah. Serving as yeah. priests and reigning as kings. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, there is also this reference in one of these verses to those who reign with Christ wearing white garments. You see this in some, for instance, icons of all saints. How Now, not every icon of all saints, but there are some all saints icons in which all the saints there and the angels are all wearing these white garments. You know, so this is straight out of the book of Revelation. And I, I just want to read uh, Revelation 24, which has this just stunning image, um, the stunning picture painted here by the Apostle John. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their forehead or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. It's just it's just astonishing, this beautiful, beautiful image there of what theosis is, you know? Yeah. Cool, cool stuff. All right. Well, to wrap up this episode, um, some final thoughts from each of us. Um, you know, number one, we, we ended up on theosis, right? Which probably you didn't think the episode about the Tower of Babel would end there. But here we are. Because that's this is one of the big arcs of the scriptures. And also, this is the arc of all three of these episodes, is that the fall of man is not just a tragedy, right? There is hope at the end of it. And um, in the midst of all of the darkness and evil that has come into the world as a result of the events that we've described that uh, from the scriptures, there is hope that not just that we would be saved out of the world— Right, that's not actually what it says in scripture, but rather that we will be saved from the evil one. And that's in the Lord's prayer before he goes to his crucifixion, that he that that those who follow him would be saved from the evil one. Right. And that means no longer under his influence. That means no longer doing his works, as we talked about in the in the last episode. But it also means Positively, not just no longer some things, but positively, it means doing the works of the Lord, doing the works of Christ, doing the works of God as our Father. And so we image Him, therefore, right? And so what this means is that ultimately, the, the telos of theosis is not, is not just, oh, we, we become like God in some kind of sort of 
attributive sense, although that's that's part of it, right? But also we become like God in terms of what he does in the world. And we see that demonstrated for us, of course, by the angels. And we see that realized in the saints. The saints take up this mantle that the fallen angels threw down when they decided to disobey, right? And so as a result, then, that means that the life of the world to come is not just a bunch of glowing beings standing up on clouds or sitting on thrones and giving orders or just, you know, it's not this static thing. It is dynamic because part of what it means to be created beings is that we're dynamic. We change. That's the way it is. Um, but it's going to be good change because we'll be preserved from sin at that point if we are in Christ, right? So the age to come, the life of the age to come is a very creative age, a very creative age. Um, you know, it's well known to pretty much anyone who listens to anything that I, that I am part of or often things that I write, that I'm a big, big fan of the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. And I'm going to bring up something that he said because it's very relevant to this. One of the letters that he wrote, he wrote to his one of his sons. And I, I don't have the quote in front of me, so I'm going to have to paraphrase a little bit. But what he says is, there is a place called heaven where all the stories that are unfinished will continue, where, where all the songs that are yet to be sung will be sung, right? And so this is part of his vision, and I think it aligns very much with the scriptures and the things we've talked about that the life of the age to come will be a creative age. It'll be creative. And I don't just mean creativity in terms of the kinds of things that we normally think of as creative stuff like art and literature and so forth. There's a creativity that every human being has that is about making and doing what is good, right? And in that, we imitate our Father, who is the creator. That is how he is revealed to us, is the one who makes things to be, the one who makes things. He's a maker, right? So, you know, the life of the age to come is not going to be a bunch of people sitting around not having a life. <laughs> it will be a, a, a creative life, a, a building life. It'll be life more abundant than what we have now. Like we shouldn't think of it as somehow less because it's not. It's going to be even more than what we have now, right? Um, you know, this idea that that the good things that we do in this life that are in the name of God, that are in accordance with his commandments, that are faithfulness to him, that this continues into the age that is to come, right? So even though the things that we build and do might seem temporary in this world, and there's a certain temporariness to them, they also have this eternal character as well, right? There's, we are making permanent contributions to the new Jerusalem, right? And so that's one way of understanding what it means for us to be saved. And I think it's a very compelling, very compelling vision of why we should want to be Christians at all, right? It's not the only thing to say about it. It's not the only angle from which to look at it, but it is absolutely part of it, that we take up these roles along with the angelic hosts as the saints have already done, and we participate in the governing, the shaping, uh, the creativity of, of this creation. Father Stephen. So um, we talked here and there, completely non-controversially, about uh, Empire this evening. And to reiterate, I don't know if we've iterated it on, on this show, but the origin of the whole concept of empire and of an emperor uh, actually, in terms of the terminology, actually comes out of Rome uh, because the Romans historically had a really bad experience with kings. Um, that's where we get the word tyrants is from their uh, early kings. And sort of, so their memory before the Republic of Kings uh, was extremely negative. So when the time came uh, for Caesar, uh, things didn't go so well for Julius. He, he, though he did die surrounded by his friends. We can say that about him. Um, <laughs> wow, that was dark, Father. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, 
uh, when it when it came to Octavian, when it came to Augustus, uh, King was the last title that that they were going to try to take um, because that would have been a step too far. And so what they come up with is Imperator. Uh, What they come up with is Conqueror. And therefore, an empire is the conquest, right? Is what has been seized, what has been taken. Um, And then what they can do with it as a conqueror. And that way of thinking isn't just something that applies at the top level of politics, right? If you're Queen Victoria or the President of the United States or Napoleon. That way of thinking is everywhere uh, and has been democratized in our modern human experience. Uh, Everyone is now made into an emperor in that everyone is sent out to conquer. You may never literally conquer the world. In fact, odds are good you won't, uh, especially if you're listening to this. Um, But you can conquer some little piece of it. You can set up some little fiefdom and you can do it at the expense of others. The more ruthless you are, the bigger an empire you can build for yourself whether it be in something like business or it be in something that most people would consider silly on the internet or something. We can all set up our little fiefdoms. We can all uh, try and put together a following of peasants who we consider beneath us. We can all exploit others and exploit the world around us. But even more so than that external temptation, right, toward others, um, Conquest itself, right, that idea itself is not always necessarily bad. Why do I say that? Well, because we also saw that word in that concept briefly when we quoted one of the letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. That terminology is used actually in all seven of them, and it's used in terms of the promise, Depending on your translation, it'll say to the one who overcomes or just straightforwardly to the one who conquers. To the one who conquers, this will be given. A white robe will be given. A new name will be given. They will sit upon Christ's throne with him. The question is, who or what are we conquering? And... What St. John is talking about in Revelation, what really Christ is, those letters were dictated by Christ to St. John in the book of Revelation. What Christ is talking about there is not setting up an empire on this earth. Business, political, military, whatever. Popularity, likes, right, as an influencer. What Christ is talking about, we see in, in the quote that we actually read, from the one letter where he talks about the fact that he himself had conquered and he himself conquered, not the Roman empire, literally in the sense of he didn't go to Rome and kill Caesar and make himself Caesar. Uh, He conquered the very demonic powers that we've been talking about all evening. So if that's what Christ did, What does it mean for us to conquer? What are we called upon to conquer as Christians? To be the one who overcomes, the one who conquers. Allow me to suggest that who we each need to conquer is ourselves. This is where self-mastery comes back into the picture. Our self, right, our soul is the territory that we need to conquer. And to conquer it, we're going to have to drive out the evil spirits and their influence that has taken up residence. So that means we're going to have to, here's what that looks like. We're going to have to conquer our pride. We're going to have to conquer our ego. You don't do that by sitting around thinking about how horrible you are and moping. We're putting on big displays of humility, 
that's not conquering pride, right? In fact, that kind of still is pride, right? What conquering pride looks like is that your ego cannot make you do anything. Someone cannot walk up to you and insult you and thereby ruin your day, cause you to sin against other people, cause you to want to take revenge against them. If you've conquered your own ego, then the worst insult that can be leveled at you, you will take as food for thought. Is there something legitimate here I can learn from? Maybe not, but maybe there is. Right? It means we need to conquer our envy and our jealousy. What does that look like? That looks like when someone around us is rejoicing and is happy and has had something good and wonderful happen to them, we're rejoicing and happy with them as if it happened to us. We're not bitter and angry that they got something we didn't or didn't have or wanted. We're not jealous. We don't resent them, right? But we're actually happy. In fact, maybe even happier that it happened to them than that it happened to us, no matter who they are, whether we like them or not, whether we get along with them or not. That's what actually conquering and mastering jealousy and envy in yourself look like. And we can say the same about any other sin, whether it's on the list of seven deadly sins or not, right? Conquering ourselves, mastering ourselves means that there is no force. There is no passion. There is nothing outside of us that can cause us to react and to do anything. That we are able to set our own limits, that we are able to choose to do that which we want to do in following Christ and becoming like him. And that's not something that you just do on a Wednesday. Today I mastered myself. Today I conquered myself. This is a battle that goes on throughout our entire lives. The day when we can say whether or not we're the one who conquers is when Christ tells us so when we reach the end. Until then we fight. To purify ourselves, to purge ourselves from these dark and evil influences. To set ourselves right. right. But this is the, the, the positive side of repentance. It's not about, repentance is not about feeling bad. It's not about moping. It's not about wearing a hair shirt. Unless you're St. John of the hair shirt. But repentance is about fighting back. And about taking back your own life and your own self and your own soul by mastering yourself. So that hopefully we can be those ones on the last day. Who Christ rewards with a palm branch and a white robe and a new name, and ultimately to come to share in his reign and rule over his creation. So those are my last thoughts. Amen. Well, that is our show for tonight. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. If you didn't get through to us live, we'd still love to hear from you. You can email us at lordofspirits at ancientfaith.com. You can message us at our Facebook page, or you can leave us a voicemail at speakpipe.com slash lordofspirits. And join us for our live broadcasts on the second and fourth Thursdays of the month at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Usually, not two weeks from now, that one's recorded, but most of the yep. time, live broadcasts. Second and fourth. Yep, yep. And if you are on Facebook, you can like our page, join our discussion group, leave reviews and ratings everywhere, but most importantly, share this show with a friend whom you know is going to love it, and it will be helpful to them. I say, share it with strangers. And finally... <laughs> Be sure to go to ancientfaith.com stroke support and help make sure we and lots of other AFR podcasters stay on the air. Thank you very much. Good night and God bless you always. You've been listening to the Lord of Spirits. Orthodox Christian priests, Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung, a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, 
and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 through 12. Welcome to 